How's it going, everyone, and welcome back to another spine-tingling episode of Buddy's House of Horror podcast. If you've read the title, you obviously know we're going to be ranking every single Nightmare on Elm Street film in the illustrious slasher franchise. And of course, I couldn't do it alone, so I had to get fan-favorite guest Midnight Miles back on the show. And we've got another long one for you guys today, so we're just going to get right to it. But I want to remind you guys, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the show on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, no matter where you're listening to the show make sure you're subscribing leave a comment rating review and we just set up our new voicemail box so if you want to go ahead and leave us a voicemail you can do that by following the number down in the description and without further ado as i said this is another long one we're just going to get right to it so now it's time to get spooky All right, boys and ghouls, we're rolling sound here. I hope everyone's been having a good October so far. What's been going on, Kat? What's going on? Well, Intr- introduce yourself to the fine people, maybe, because this is going to be the first top 10 list with you on it of the year. Maybe some people are new to the show. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Just a brief, brief introduction. Well, Midnight Miles, that is my, uh, my podcast name, you know, I guess you could say. Um, we've done quite a few of these together. Well, uh, Two Nerds, a podcast, which I think is being rebranded, isn't that? It's what going it? through a rebrand. rebrand. At, the, at the time of recording this, I'm not sure exactly what okay. it's going to be. Allegedly, Jared is in the process of composing the music for it. Oh, so wow. we're going to see how okay. that goes. Apparently, he's working on some synthwave song for the intro, but All right, I'm, we'll I'm, see. I'm, I'm very <laughs> interested in that, but yeah, um... Thank you for having me back, as always. Um, the people that don't know me, thank God you haven't heard me on the other podcast, because half the time, thankfully we're sitting here on a beautiful fall day, and uh, recording this during the day, which is a rarity for the both of us, I feel like. Maybe not yourself with your individual ones, but for us, usually these start he's, around he, the he, 10 he's, to midnight hour. He's called Midnight Miles for a reason. That's normally when he'll roll out, yeah. so... Yeah, so thankfully I'm here and I'm not um, out of my mind, which the, the handful of you that know me from other podcasts, I apologize in advance for all of the, or actually not in advance, uh, in hindsight I apologize for all of my rough, my rough podcasts that I've, I've done, but thank you for listening and I'm stoked to be back for another season. We can call these seasons, right? Yeah, this is a new season, yeah, so, we, I break them up into seasons, yeah. Not really just living in this it's not even a post-pandemic world in this in this Delta variant world that we're living in, you know? Right, Kat. It's a really good time of year. I wish October didn't always feel so short. It's uh, the shortest time of it, the year. It it's the worst. It feels the shortest month of the year. Um, February feels fucking longer than, than it October It really does. does. And it's sad. It to drags. Say. February it does. drags. October, I mean, like... You're watching horror films. I know people going to pumpkin patches, doing all this kind of stuff in October. It tends to really fly by. And, of course, like, I mean, people are just getting in the swing of, like, school if they're going back to school. And it's just, right. like, a very, very quick time of year. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a good summer and beginning of fall. I mean, better than, I think, when we did the last top ten last year. We did, we did the Halloween sequels, uh... Minus Halloween three, yes. but uh, still just got to shout out season of the witch. But um, much better spot in my life, so I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have made it a year and a half into this pandemic, and I'm happy to be back. And I'm really excited to do this one. And the first we've of, talked about we've been talking about doing this, but take well, I had brought it up. I think, like, in January was when we first, like, decided, like, hey, I think we're going to do this. Of course, we announced it with the season finale of last year. I snuck it into that. I mentioned it, and I'm like, ah, who cares? You know, I mean, it's a good, it's a little good spoiler, I feel like. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, so we are going to be ranking the Nightmare on Elm Street series. Um, What was your introduction to Nightmare on Elm Street? Because me... When I was a kid, like, I was always aware of who Freddy Krueger, like, was. But, like, in elementary school and stuff, like, people are dressing up as Freddy, all that kind of stuff. But I'd never watched any of the films until, like, high school. So, of the main series, 
from what I consider main series, I guess, uh, a lot of the iconic horror films from the 70s and 80s, I feel like I got to f the Nightmare on Elm Street series kind of later, I guess. Like, I pretty much, by the time I started watching Nightmare on Elm Street, I'd seen all the Halloweens, all the Friday the 13th, I think every single Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well. Um, so, of, of the bigger ones, it was kind of, you know, towards the end of that, I'd always... I, I think I had seen one of the Nightmare on Elm Streets, and I cannot remember what one at all at, like, a somewhat young age, but I just remember it in bits, in bits and pieces. Like, I remember watching it, do not remember what what actual film it was in the series. I don't think it was the first one. Um, there was a music store, music and game store, huh, music and games, that <laughs> I, I've referenced on this podcast before, but I feel like for the town that you might have been a little young, I don't think maybe... For anyone on the podcast, but he's a few years younger than me. Not a lot, but just enough where... It's a time, different time. Yeah. Like, because you started high school in the early 2000s. I didn't start until, like, the late 2000s. It's like a weird, like... It's it's almost like a cultural, like, gap. Like, it's kind of, like, weird yeah. to, like, think of... Because, like, we're only, like, three years apart, but it's just, like... It was just, like, so different, It I is, guess. yeah. So. That weird transition. Um... Music and Games was a store kind of on the edge of the town that we grew up in. Um, That's the one in Saybrook, right? The one that's yeah, it's in like Saybrook. Right yeah, I consider yeah. that the, I mean, basically the last shopping anything in Ashtabula if you were to go, you know, yeah. that far out. Yeah. But uh, a lot of my, like, early finding out about films, finding out things was actually at this place. Um, I mentioned it in one of the other podcasts, my, one of my earliest memories of buying American Werewolf in London. I actually, I think the first podcast you ever had me on, I mentioned this because it, like I hold, yeah, yeah. hold so dear, like American Werewolf in London and Night of the Living Dead in the same day. Which he's, which he still store. hasn't shown me, by the way. I bring oh, it up Night, all oh, the time. Oh, that Night of the Living Dead DVD. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that over. We're, we're going to do a podcast and I'm going to bring it over and do a live reveal. Um, you know what would be something sick that we should consider doing? Mm. Night of the Living Dead is public domain. So we can do whatever we want with it. What if we did a full commentary someday? Maybe not this year, but at some point in the future, could be. I might, I might push the push the buttons before the month's over. We might do that actually. Yeah. Uh, just, just you know, I'm thinking now. Now you got my brain running, but uh, I'd be down for that. Obviously, I, I just admitted that. So, and we'd yeah. watch it on your DVD. <laughs> I'd be down. Uh, I have the, I have the criterion of that too with all the bonus features and everything too. Yeah, I think I have like three or four releases of Nether and Dead to be honest. But uh, so Music and Games, um, someone had brought in the first Nightmare on Elm Street complete collection. Mind you, this was probably right before Freddy vs Jason came out. Obviously, years before the remake came out. So the initial. Right. Every, one to New Nightmare. Um, maybe some like early, some of the like early DVD collectors or people listening to this will, will remember this pack, but it was like a brown or a black, like thick cardboard box. And then each of the films made up like uh, some sort of picture of Freddy, like across it. Mm -hmm. And it had like a brownish hue, all the logos and stuff. And Freddy was in like this like bronze -ish, bronze ish color on the outside of it and said, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street Complete Collection. Well, they had it up on a high shelf. I think it was behind the counter. And I went one day and traded. I think I had done work. This is right before I was working. I was probably like 14 or 15. Traded some stuff I had and then put a little money because it was like, he used to give me deals on stuff too. I guess we'll do it. So you were a valued customer yeah, of this place. He, yeah. he liked me because despite being so young, uh, Anytime I had any, I didn't have an allowance, but anytime I did work for anyone, I took my money to music and games and spent it. So he liked, and I also had interest and even knowledge at a young age of a lot of things that the owner, he's like, well, he couldn't believe some of the stuff that I, we would talk about. So he'd go, oh, I'll give you this for this. Or he always, as long as no one was in there when I was in there, yeah. deals. So I think he gave me 10 or $15 off that. Nightmare on Elm Street box set, which was actually a lot at the time. I was just able to get it. I took it home, and I just start. I like I didn't really binge things, but like, 
basically binge the series all in a pretty quick setting. Um, but I think I was like 14 or 15 when I finally watched all of them. And I, I'd only, like I said, maybe seen one of them before that. Yeah. And like I said, I don't remember my first introduction to them. Um, but I would say, like, even as a kid, because a lot of people like to lump these, like, slasher films all together. Like, yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street... Uh, Halloween and Friday the 13th. With Friday the 13th and Halloween, I like kind of get it, how you could get those confused. But with The Nightmare on Elm Street, it's definitely the most unique out of all of them. Oh, es- yeah. Especially because, I mean, like, your main killer isn't just, like, a faceless guy behind a mask. Freddy has a personality, he has a voice, he has charisma, he's all these things that set it so far apart from the other slashers, it's, like, weird to even compare and contrast like with like as i said with halloween and nightmare on elm street with halloween and friday the 13th rather it's a little easier to do that sort of yeah. thing but like this it's so very much its own thing i guess nightmare on elm street and uh, i watched rewatched these with the woman that i'm seeing now and this was the first time that she'd ever seen these and i really explained and i would say at least half the series it almost gets to be like fantasy slash comedy horror like it almost really when you watch a few of the later films especially freddy's dead i'm not gonna spoil too much of the podcast but it is it's basically a comedy the, the horror, like a horror pretty much co- gone. it's gone i yeah. mean it's basically especially freddy's dead there's not almost one horror element in it he's tongue-in-cheek pulling out gags and stuff like this and he's looking right at the camera and smiling and like kind of poking fun with his, like, victims. Like, it's very... There's not a scare, I don't think, in that film. Which is weird, because, like, when you watch them all in order, like, it doesn't seem like that much of a stretch. But if you were to just pop the first one in and then pop in Freddy's Dead, you're just like, what happened? Yeah. And, I mean, in the first one, he has a few jokes. I mean, there's the tongue out of the phone and stuff like that. But, like, just seeing such, like, a drastic shift like that. You know, that was that is my biggest detractor from the Nightmare on Elm Street films, in a sense, was that I like horror comedy films. I love the Return of the Living Dead series. Uh, I, I love, you know, Night of the Creeps. I love horror comedy or things that can like mash genres together. But it's hard because I started, I'm a big fan of the first two Nightmare on Elm Streets. We're not going to give too much away, but. I love the straight horror, the menace, the, you know, kind of this dream demon that just, you know, you have no way to stop him. When you really think of Nightmare on Elm Street, like compared to a lot of horror franchises, just in general, doesn't have to be slasher, it doesn't have to be be supernatural or anything, but it's one of the more terrifying backstories or thoughts because... You, you can't get away from them in your dreams. I mean, you can't help that you're dreaming about this person. We as human beings need to sleep. It's literally yeah. programmed into our bodies, so there's no way to fully avoid this evil. Like, you can't just blow them up with a rocket launcher. You can't just dismember them. You can't, you know... And you can't get away from them. It's not like Friday the 13th or something. It's like, all right, well, don't go camping. Like, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, there's no, like, easy way out of this find, one. Find a way to get in a car and just drive 400 miles away. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I mean yeah. It's like, you're going to fall. You can fall asleep in Alaska. You can fall asleep in California. Freddy's fucking coming for you. There's no way around it. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, I think we'll do this the same way that we did the last one. Was We'll go back and forth. And um, good. There's only nine films to pick from this time. Um, it would have been good if there was a tenth. It would. Um, oh yeah, we can't really call this a, a top ten then. It's just a. It's, it's a, just a ranking. A series ranking, yeah. Have you, well, I guess okay. So yeah, there's nine films and there's actually a TV show like Freddy's Nightmares, but I've never seen any of oh, those. Oh, I've watched it. I used to. Is when, he like a character, or does he just introduce the stuff like a he crypt is, keeper? Or he's is he more like, of a, a horror host. Okay. I I do believe. Don't quote me, Internet. I feel like a lot of times I, when I listen back on these, you know, I'm listening, I'm like, God damn it, I know the real answer to this question, but I can't remember it when I'm actually doing this. I think there's somewhere 
there's a few, I think there might be three to five episodes where he might be an actual main character. Okay. Like, in that. But a lot of times he just shows up and kind of, it's more of like a morality tale where he shows up, talks for like four or five minutes. He's like, if you would do that, you know, like, if you would do this, you wouldn't have to worry about ha ha. And he like cracks like a one-liner joke and it goes right into the actual story. Right. So it's very much a cautionary tale of the week, monster of the week, you know, thriller of the week that was just branded as a Nightmare on Elm Street thing because he would show up, excuse me, in costume, full makeup sometimes. And I mean, obviously that's what they sold the the series on. The show on, on, yeah. But they're pretty good. Actually, I don't know if you you remember El Rey Network. Yeah. El Rey, I used to have cable, obviously, up until a few years ago. Even as, as recent as about four or five years ago, El Rey had bought a ton of the rights to a lot of the episodes, not all of them. And they would show them like once a month at random times. They'd show four, five, okay. six episodes yeah. back. So I, I used El Rey, I would just scan the DVR or scan like the guide for like as far as I could see. Oh, I need to record this. Oh, because they would just have a thing and be like, just random. Three to five a.m. Drop something crazy like a '90s uh, obscure cartoon or like whatever they get their hands on. They would have yeah. random. It didn't even have to be the weekend. It could be like Wednesday, like three to five. We're gonna show four episodes of Freddy's Nightmares or whatever. So yeah. I do it and I would record and then I would just keep it on there, rewatch, and they, you know, there are a few years that they showed a bunch of episodes of it. I had seen some of them otherwise before. I'm pretty sure some of the episodes made it to VHS. Okay. I think. Don't some of the some of the VHS hounds out there probably could give us a better answer, but I'm sure now it's on some sort of DVD, right? I, I would imagine. I can look it up. I don't. While you're I don't know, because I, I, I really I haven't seen anything about it in years. But I've been thankful that I've been able to watch numerous episodes of it over the years. Um, I don't even remember what network it was on when it premiered. It doesn't look like there's a DVD on that's it. That's what I mean. At least not I, on Amazon. I don't think there. That's what I mean. It's. I feel like it's kind of rare to see it, uh, the episodes. The whole time I had the same cable box, I left them. I never deleted them in case anyone ever wanted to watch an episode or see them or whatever. Um, and it's not really streaming anywhere either. Some people have uploaded some episodes to YouTube. Makes sense. Um, but, oh, well, I guess there is a DVD. A two disc. It's unavailable. You can't get it. Um... Freddy's Nightmares 2 Disc Collector's Edition, Volume 1, Season 1, Episodes 1 through 6, and I don't know how many... They probably never even followed up with doing everything. Right, 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 right. But... Um, if you ever get a chance to watch any episodes, even if you just can watch two, three, four of them, like, it's... You would like you were talking about Twilight Zone so that earlier when we were talking. I mean, I feel like it's definitely right up your alley. I right, mean, yeah, the you, horror anthology. Yeah, kind of you thing. would definitely enjoy it. Yeah, probably more similar to like Tales of the Dark Side or something yeah, like it's that because it was like at the same, same time, same era, right before that. On honestly, if anything, I feel like Tales of the Dark Side. I don't know they might have come out exactly at the same time, late eighties. Just like the Friday the Thirteenth, the TV series. You ever watched that? No, I haven't. That's. That's actually out on a full series DVD, and I've wanted to buy it for years and just never... I've had it in my hands before, and I was like, ah, I don't, you know, I don't need to spend the money and stuff, because it's not a cheap purchase. Right, yeah. You know, you're not, you're just like, oh, I'm going to casually go to the store and buy this X amount of dollar <laughs> box set, you know, like, but I think El Rey used to have episodes of that, and then you, the Chiller Network, when they were doing that for a while, mm-hmm. had that on as well, so I've been able to watch a lot of that, but... Fred Thirteenth, the series. Jason's not in it at all. I think he's oh, really? I think he's only referenced. Yeah, he's not in it at all. Hmm. It's almost like um, it's more of like a, if I remember right, almost like a weird kind of con- conspiracy, but almost like as a flow of like X Files to me. Okay. Minus not as much sci-fi, a little more horror, but like kind of that feel where there uh, it's like a group of. Uh, I think like two or three people kind of like searching for strange phenomena or stuff like okay. that. So, but how does it tie into part of the 13th then? <laughs> it honestly, it's probably the most <laughs> loosely tied property of all time. Like, I it's one of those things where someone was like, We'll just sell a series on this. To my knowledge, from what I remember from the episodes and stuff I've read, 
I think Jason's only like referenced. I don't think he's in okay. any episode. Gotcha. It, if we're wrong, throw it in the comments, please. Put some knowledge because we're doing a couple deep dives right here, stuff that I've seen, but it's been a while been a and I haven't time, seen yeah. all of it. So if I'm wrong, those fans out there, please, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Well, I guess we can go ahead and dive right in. Um, you just watched all these films within the past couple weeks. For True. me, it's been a while. Um, it's I watched all of these around my birthday. Um, it was in March. So you're going to have to carry a little bit of the specific plot uh, elements. Okay, all right. But I do have my like general notes and stuff that I took at the time. Um, and I did a little research before this just to sort of fill in the gaps. But this is still my original ranking from when I watched it back then, except I flip-flopped a couple, which we'll get to. Just two films flipped. Uh, I'll say mine is pretty damn close. I'm hoping that when we rewatch a couple of the other series we talked about that I'm a little more shocked. But my Nightmare on Elm Street rankings, pretty damn close to what they were otherwise. Yeah. Um, so we'll start things off with our number nines. Um, I think I'm praying to God that we have the same number nine. If, pretty, if, if we don't have the for same once, <laughs> for once in our for once in our lives of any of these podcasts we've done, I'm pretty sure we're on the same boat. All right. We'll do the remake. The remake. The remake. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 the Thank remake. God. Yeah. Yeah. The remakes. Clearly, you know what? Part of me, because I look for the entertainment parts of everything, a lot of times some of these remakes, some of these things, I I want to rank them better than, than I do. But to be honest, I watched this the night it came out. Jared was actually, as some of the uh, Dynamite Jared, him and I went to Erie, Pennsylvania, and watched it with some friends, a midnight showing, and... The theater was really into it when I saw like people were clapping and cheering and screaming and really really into it, um, and I was actually I remember when I all even Jared I, honestly all of us when we left were like, you know, obviously Robert England's not Freddie, but for the most part we're like oh we were pretty damn entertained like we thought it was pretty decent. The thing is I think a lot of that dealt with the fact that it went back to straight horror. It wasn't. True. Yeah. It wasn't him playing a video game of someone, uh, or you know, or yeah. doing all this. It brought it back to its roots, but I think it brought it back too far because it's also just blatantly ripping off the original. Yeah. Like all, like every, like the body in the hallway, yeah, the yeah, 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 Freddy yeah. coming out of the wall. Yeah, and I mean the effects are terrible. Yeah, I, I'm right around this time is when a bunch of, from what I remember from a lot of films, a bunch of uh, films had all of their practical effects either added CG into them or they reshot parts because I feel like people were banking on CG because this was right, this was 2010. This was 2010. Right, right yep. at the turn of everything, and I think people were still on that push. What year did what year did The Walking Dead come out? Was it right before this? It must have been. Maybe. Right after? I don't know, it was around that time, I, I feel yeah. like it showed people... That was kind of a series that was like... They were like, oh, we can fully blend practical and a light CG and it looked incredible. Right. Where people in film were like, oh, we can just go in and reshoot a whole part with CG or you can do 25% makeup and 75% CG... And You're not Greg Nicotero, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm and, sorry. And, yeah, and and the results were pretty fucking poor on some of these. And the thing is, if I remember right, the initial stills from this film were all practical, and the initial Freddy makeup was different than what they had shown in the film. And I think too, there are scenes in this. If I remember, because I rewatched this. Eh, somewhat recently too. Not this one. Not not. You didn't really need to rewatch it for this I podcast. Did. I <laughs> didn't. No, I no, I didn't rewatch for the podcast. I rewatched it because uh, it was on a multi Blu-ray pack I had. I rewatched. I think during the like last year, twenty twenty, during the pandemic, because it had been probably actually it's funny ten years since I had seen it, and I was hoping it was going to be because I remember having a better memory of it, but then I watched it. Uh, and a lot of parts fell flat, which I'll talk about in a second. But 
you can see Freddie's makeup is actually because I really watched this. He's like, there, I'm pretty sure there's four different makeups. So there's one where I think there's a big open wound on his face, and then it goes to another scene, and it's just complete burn. Or like, I feel like they were playing around with what you could do with CG and makeup in this, but it looks like they're playing around. Like they, right, they there's no yeah. continuity. I guess is the best way. There's no continuity with the makeup or some of the things. I yeah, I I can understand that. Um, me, I have absolutely no nostalgia for it whatsoever. The first time I actually watched it was in preparation for this. Oh, so wow. okay. I had never, I had of course seen the Halloween one and Friday the 13th, uh, remakes prior to this. Um, this one out of the eighties, like remake things, this one is like by far the weakest, I would say. Um, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I, oh yeah. Like I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. W- we talked last year about the Halloween one and how it's okay. I like the Friday the Thirteenth one. I do, um, and I think that one has gotten a lot of people now. I've seen online like really trump that film. They're like, you know what? It took all of like the greatest hits parts of Jason, put it into a film, and there's really it, it's just it's not a bad Friday the Thirteenth yeah. film at all, honestly. Yeah. But this one re- relied way too much on the original. Um, it's not fun at all. Like even the or- no. e- even the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes, it's a dark film. It's a scary film. It's still fun to watch. Like this one. Like I was. It was just like a slog to get through. It, at one point, and this probably had no effect on you whatsoever. But as we said, I'm a little bit younger than you, so SpongeBob was huge. When I was a kid. And you're probably wondering how the hell this ties into the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. Clancy Brown, the guy who plays the police detective, or maybe he's like the principal or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When they go to the place to burn Freddy down in, like, the factory or whatever, he's the voice of Mr. Krabs on SpongeBob. I'm glad you're putting in some deep knowledge. I have no idea. Because I was crying laughing because he's screaming like freddy like going like not in the mr krabs uh, voice yeah, yeah i was yeah. pissing myself yeah okay See, um, i yeah i mean that that went right over my head obviously so that this is a great this is why i do these podcasts for these little tidbits that i had no idea about you know and you do the same for me all the time bro so that's that's what yeah, it's all about it's good I but I yeah no I, was, idea. I was crying laughing so that was the only part of the movie I thought was fun because, and it's not even anything to do with the film itself. It's just something that I recognized. My favorite part of the remake, because I find I found parts that I like about it, when they were in, like I saw in the theater, and the whole theater bur- burst into laughter. I think there were some fun parts, but the film was so overly dark with like the subject matter, which we'll talk about in a sec. We're not going to stay too long on this one, but. When you they look down and they're in the backyard scene and the dog is cut up <laughs> oh, yeah. and he comes around he puts his hand like almost on like a, a pipe or something he comes around real quick with his face he's like I only meant to pet him or like I can't remember exactly what the line was but it was so quick and seeing the big screen whole theater burst into laughter and I still remember like when I watched it again I was like like a little kid, like in anticipation, like waiting for the scene. Right, man. You have that nostalgia for it. Yeah, yeah. like, it was, I, there's a couple things I really like in it. Um, I think it, I like a lot of the actors and actresses that are in this, and it sucks because the best actress in this was in her absolute worst role she's ever had as Nancy. Rooney Mara or whatever. Right, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very talented. She's a very good actress. Yeah. But she is horrible in this. And I've done some reading. I actually read when I watched this. I'm pretty sure she auditioned for this but didn't want the part at all. It was like her agent or all of them would also be a good role, like get you into America or get you... Right, yeah, yeah. Whatever. And I feel like it came through because a lot of her lines sound like she's bored or uninspired. And it sucks because I've seen her in a dozen films after and she's great. Yeah. I real and I think she is a really good actress, but it does not come off at to be honest, I don't know how the fuck she got cast for some of those good roles <laughs> after she did this because it was bad. Like I could tell she didn't give a shit. 
I didn't feel like there. It, that's the big separation that I think probably the weakest part of this remake. You don't feel any connection to like Nancy at all. Where in the like the other actors and actresses around her, I feel like are genuinely trying to be terrified, genuinely in the roles they're giving, and then she just sticks out a sore thumb. Like something horrible is going on. The other actors actually freaking out. She's like, yeah, 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 sure, yeah. Like just completely, it just. It's not. Yeah. Like, it takes you out. It takes me out of it, completely. Yeah. What else you got to say about the remake? I, I have nothing else really. It, to... That's what I was like. Ah, I don't want to stay too long in this. I think I had more memories because I did see it in theaters. It was at a time where I was going to theaters constantly, right in the middle to the end of the remake boom. Um, you know, I was early twenties when this came out, and but I was seeing everything that was in theaters. So like. You know, I yeah. remember it a little more fondly than not not that it's good, but I remember it a little more than some people. Uh, I like Jackie Earl Haley as an actor. I just think that the script and the lines and the way that he was given, like a lot of people, I think were trying to place blame on him for some of the stuff, and it wasn't his fault. He's a good actor. Another yeah, films I I've mean, seen him in. It's it's almost like an impossible task. It is because I, I mean, thing. like Michael Myers under a mask, as we said, yeah. like. Freddy Krueger is a character, so it's not like you can just get anyone to do it, and no, no matter what you do, it's always going to be compared to Robert England. Yeah, it so. was, and it, it is an impossible task, and I, I I think they even had interviews for this came out saying how they knew how challenging it was going to be to do this, and even after, I mean, I, I don't think his career was ever fully the same after this, because he had a lot of, like, decent supporting roles or things like that after, and I think, like, he was never the main guy again. He yeah, like, like he yeah. he was in a bunch of great stuff in the late late two thousand or late yeah late two thousands, and then this came out and this was just I feel bad for him because I think he's a good actor too. Right, but you ready to you ready to move? Yeah, on? Yeah, sure. You you can go ahead with your number. You eight. You want me to go with? Yeah, you can go eight. ahead with All your right. number eight. Um, this is I'm not sure how this is gonna play out with the rankings of these because I knew for sure we were going to have that one at the bottom um, but the rest of this is kind of going to be a free for all I think um, for some of these so, so especially for you and your opinions of things <laughs> oh my god I the thing is though at least yeah, at least I feel like people know when I go and rank something or talk about something at least they know like I'm completely honest even yes. if you hate my <laughs> yes. take on it like I'm, but I also usually have reasons why I feel this way. It's not like I'm just like you're not trolling anyone. I'm not you, you, trolling. you have you have it's, your reasons. It's not. I'm not trying to be edgy. This is just how I fucking feel about these films or games or whatever. So we we might even add the same number eight. I don't know. I don't know. Go ahead. Nightmare on Elm Street uh, five. The Dream Child. Bless. We have the we same do? one. We okay, have, all right. Well, that, that's have, probably where that's us. that's probably where the similarities are going to end, at least for a minute. I, mean, I actually have this one on VHS. If you want to do, ooh, let's if you want to pull that one out, I love the covers. Some of these I don't products. have all of them on VHS. I just have a few scattered wow, ones. Wow, this, this uh, media release cover, yeah, this is fucking sick. The, the, Way better than the film. The fans at home did not <laughs> see this. Um. <laughs> I'm gonna throw up looking at the back of this because how fucking stupid and funny it is. Oh, the uh, the, the the boy who wants to be Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, this was classic late '80s horror. Um, by the time it got to the late '80s, horror comedy became a big thing. Uh, a lot of stuff I feel like wasn't remotely scary, and not even Nightmare on Elm Street, like in general, and. I feel like companies were just throwing anything they could at the wall. Sequel-wise, film-wise, they're like, oh, Freddy could do or this, or Jason could do this, or whatever. Let's just cool, yeah. film it. Film it. We need, a, right. we need a movie. We need something in the theaters. It was maybe not for the people directing or writing it, but... But the studios the behind it. The yes. producers, just... It's another year's going by. We need a fucking... Because they had one of these pretty much every year. This was 1989, yeah. so this was the last one of the 80s. Um, this is also the one where they stopped numbering them. So it says five on this VHS here. It says five on all the posters. 
when you actually watch the film, it just says A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Child. Oh, it doesn't right. say it doesn't say that. five. And yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know if they were trying to hide that they made so many so quick, or like <laughs> I don't know what the deal was. But this was the last one that they numbered. Well, like, this was the first one where they stopped numbering them. Right. Because Freddy's Dead obviously didn't have one. New Nightmare obviously didn't have one either. Right. Um, um I feel like this is the one that was the. L- it sucks. Least inspired. <laughs> well, well, I wouldn't even say least inspired because it has some of the best effects work. It that does. They've done. The effects work's insane. Um, there's like the stop motion fridge. There's yeah. a there's tons of like creativity involved in this, but it's just horrible. But it's <laughs> like from, it's, it's so from bad. A makeup artist special. That's that's yeah. the thing. As we're about to talk about these, we talked about this a little bit ago. I always get reminded when I watch these. Because I watch these probably not as much as the other big franchises. Right. Freddy, like, still, when I said it, I got to him later, like, I love Freddy. I have two Nightmare on Elm Street influenced things hanging on the wall where I live currently. But, for some reason, I don't go back to the series as much as Friday the 13th or Halloween. Uh, so, like, there's a little bit bigger gaps when I watch these, but every time I go back... The special effects teams on all these, especially, I would say, 4, 5, and 6. 3 had great... The other ones had great special effects, for sure. But they didn't have the scale of them. These had huge scale. Where like right. I talked about them almost being fantasy horror because they had these big rooms, like, like the uh, stained glass areas in like 4 and 5, and... Right. Uh, Freddy's body being pulled apart or full frontal body suits. And uh, I really like the aesthetic of this film as well. Okay, like, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. like, I don't know, there's like the even not even the special effects, but like some of the set pieces. That, yeah, like, that's there's, right. Yeah. There's like the big like castle that's like straight out of like a hammer film. Yep. Yep. And yep, stuff like yep. that. Like, I, that's why I like feel bad like ragging on it because it like, it, had much higher of a potential from the effects standpoint. Yeah. But, like, the story isn't there. And to me, it's one of the more memorable ones out of the sequels, but it's more memorable for some of the wrong reasons, I guess. Right. Like, I guess, like, for example, like, normally I do not care about this sort of thing at all. There are only three kills in the film, which normally isn't, like, I don't... The reason I... And bringing it up is because that just shows you this is like an almost like two hour film, and there's just so no, this much one's shorter. It's no. like it's got to be like no not ninety no, minutes. No, no. It's I ninety will, minutes nine, at least. It's, it's I think it's eighty nine minutes on Holy, the dot. It feels a lot longer. They won't even have. They won't even tell you. It feels a lot longer, but what I'm trying to say, there's so much like convoluted like plot elements in here that I don't, it just feels like so long. It says ninety minutes. My Blu-ray said. Uh, 129, 15, you know, whatever. They're going to round it up to 90 minutes. But there's just so much in this film that's just like, I don't know. I can agree with you on that, but I just watched this three days ago. Mm -hmm. And this one, maybe it is the lack of kills or lack of whatever. This one flew by for me. We're like, okay, so I watched it. It got to the hour and 20 mark. And, uh... Me and the person I was watching it with both were falling asleep. I paused it. I was like, oh, let's watch it in the morning. Like, finish it. And I thought, I'm like, oh, there's probably another 20, 25 minutes left. Yeah, it's it like almost over. No, yeah, no, it didn't feel. I'm like, they didn't get anywhere with any of the story. And they're looking, there's nine minutes left of the film. And I was just like, and I watch it and it kind of just, it just ends. Like, it, it uh, there is, it is convoluted. But maybe it was just, is, maybe it was just the circumstances in which I was watching it. Cause I was essentially binging all of them. Yeah. But this one, maybe from an entertainment standpoint, it felt like a slog when I was watching it. The thing is, it is a slog in a sense. I get where you're, I think a lot of things happen where the reason there's only three kills is because a ton of shit happens to try to build Alice's story, but it doesn't go anywhere. And then even the payoff only happens in that last, like, eight or nine minutes, like, probably eight minutes, and it's, like, all of a sudden, the boy that we talked about is on the back cover that wants to be, you know, Freddy or, or in that, 
his stuff is only like at the end, like one or two minutes, and he's basically gone. Right. And then the whole Freddy and everything that happens with Amanda Kruger uh, is extremely quick, too. Uh, I guess let's talk about a little bit, because we have a lot to get to, but I guess this is an overarching thing, something I wanted to bring up with all the films. So there's really three main final girls in the whole series. Right. We're getting into the actual main series now, not the remake, whatever. But there's Nancy, Kristen, and Alice. Right. Alice is the final one. Her story is dealt with in between four and five. Alice, I remember in other watches, liking her more. But honest to God, she is a worthless fucking character besides the (laughs) end of four. No, I'm serious. Everyone around her... Almost every, all of her friends get killed or bad things or happen is because she tells them about Freddy, but doesn't do anything to help them. Yet she has Kristen's power to jump into dreams, and she almost never uses it. Her character in, in 5, especially, is fucking worthless. She's pregnant during it, and that's basically it. Even the whole finale, she basically is a bystander watching Amanda and the boy do everything and she's just like standing there like watching this happen like she's part of the audience it happens Amanda's like get the fuck out of here just go have your baby and that's it and then it cuts the scene and happy you know the the alcoholic dad that's now sober Alice's dad they're playing with the baby and it just ends Right. but like really Alice's powers and everything and she's supposed to be the main heroine in this she does not do shit in five and until the end it sucks because her character gets built up so well in four but she causes a bunch of needless death in my opinion i do not watching again alice's character i just think is piss poor in a lot of this i hope i get some angry comments on that maybe in the series but what do you think uh again it's not as fresh in my memory so i'm gonna take your word for it um, I do remember how she, in the finale, is just, she's kind of existing. Yeah. Um, when, again, like, she does have the power. She is the new dream master. Yeah. And she, I, right, yeah, I agree with everything She you just said. doesn't, uh, yeah, go ahead, you keep, we'll, we'll talk about well, more. Well, just, like, in, in part five, and again, I feel bad ragging on it, because I do think it had, like, some good ideas. Like, in this one, it gives more of Freddy's backstory in it. Amanda Kruger is more fully fleshed out because she's talked about in three. Uh, well, she's obviously. in three. Well, she's, she's in, she's in well, briefly. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess, yeah. But you get his backstory a little bit in that, and then more of his backstory in this. Uh, but I do like that her story in this, and, like, Alice not knowing is because... Nancy never had the time to talk to Kristen about this. And then Kristen basically giving Alice her powers. She never, so like the whole Amanda Kruger thing to her is fresh and new. She doesn't understand what's going on or who she is, I think, until right at the end of the film. Right. Um, And yeah, I mean, and I feel bad like ragging on it. And I also like. It feels like it should have been a lot better than it is. Like, when we get to part four, um, like, some of the things, like, behind the scenes on the set of part four, like, would have improved by the time they did part five. Um, And it's just, like, shocking that it's not... It just missed the mark on pretty much every front. Right. Um, I Again, from an effects standpoint, I mean, I love the, the comic book shit. Um, yeah. I love when he like tears his own arm off and like throws, throws it at the yeah, fucking yeah. car. Okay, the probably one of my favorite effects or kills in the entire film, and also still the most high point for me in this is the motorcycle scene with Dan, the boyfriend. Yeah, because that effect when the motorcycle becomes him and like vice versa, and his whole body gets transformed, is absolutely in fucking sane as someone that has been to school for special effects and has done makeup and stuff like that the amount of hours and the amount of time it must have took just for that three to five minute scene is it's not fathomable now like I know that like basically they were bringing in the best special effects artists at the time to do it but they had groups of them because that's such a huge just that effect alone 
is insane and probably arguably one of my favorites, if not my favorite in the whole series. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, from an effect standpoint, I can't really complain. Like, everything looks good. Um, but then, like, some of the effects are stupid. Like, when, like, he's just, like, shoving the food in her mouth. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good effect, but it just looks dumb. It's just Because it's just, like, it's yeah, a dumb idea. It's a dumb idea. It's right on the back here. Her cheeks are all exploded. She can't swallow. Yet her mouth is open, and you can see down her. She face. looks like doesn't... she looks like the the radiator girl from Eraserhead. She does. That's the best way to. That's the best way to put it. Um, do you have anything else to say, or should we move on? Um, let's see. I think I covered everything in my notes. I like Freddy's like demon birth stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, like it's I very, said, like I said, it's it had entertaining. A, it had a lot of like good things that could and should have happened that didn't. They just missed. The mark on a lot of it. I think probably on paper, this film sounded way better than it was actually executed. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, as opposed to part four, where some things weren't necessarily on paper. But we'll get to that. Yep, you probably have a better... I wish I would have watched... I've watched part of Never Sleep Again, the documentary, and I kind of wish I would have rewatched it or watched the whole thing before doing this, because... We probably could have pulled up a bunch of uh, little things about the production and stuff like that. So right. I think you're going to give me some knowledge on this. Um, do you want to go ahead with your seven, or do you want well, me to go yeah, ahead? Yeah, we're, well, we're not blowing through it, but we're kind of. Uh, you want me to go, huh? I'll do it. All right, number seven. This is where, okay, I will say, I talked about this with you before we recorded this. It's really hard for me to rank this series because I think on any given day I could flip flop almost all of them. Not all of them, not five, like not the remake <laughs> of five, but some of the other ones I could just do just a flip flop. Like this is here, this is here. Not ranking them much higher, but just right. they're close. So this is one that's probably going to upset you, but I'm going to do New Nightmare. Okay. Um, I understand what it was going for and what it did, and I think it's genius in its own way. And I'm one of... I don't know. I really like the look of Freddy. I'll call him real-world Freddy, even though that's not a thing. Right, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I think it's really cool, and I think also it came out at a very interesting time for horror, and we've mentioned it in multiple podcasts here, for any, you know, the regular listeners. You know... 1994, if you weren't doing direct-to-video horror, if you were doing theatrical horror, 93 was probably worse. But 93 and 94 are probably one of the worst years to try to probably release a theatrical horror film. Like, horror was at a fucking low. Right. I mean, you, you know, we've talked about this. There wasn't many notable films that had come out those years, in my opinion. I mean, you have stuff like Nightbreed or, you know... Candyman or little things that snuck through. The biggest horror film at the time was Jurassic Park, and most people wouldn't even consider that a horror film. Yeah. So that goes to, sh- I mean, uh, amazing film, but when you're thinking of like horror films, it's not really one that comes to mind. The, I the, guess. The early to mid 90s until really even Scream, until Scream really was pretty dark, pretty bad. It, it's funny because there's a ton of 90s horror films I love. But like you, you said, there's a lot of hidden gems in there, like Nightbreed and Candyman and stuff like that, but, like, nothing that's, like... Nothing ga- that like, was a phenomenon, fi- like, a phenomena film. Like, you're like, oh, my God, the new Nightmare on Elm Street's out. Like, that just wasn't happening right. at the time, you know? Not until probably Scream, and then they do Scream 2 and the sequels, where somebody's like, I have to hit the theater this weekend because this is coming out. Right. It just wasn't... People were in a Forrest Gump, and, you know, I, you know and... Jurassic Park and things like it was much more of a it was just a different time yeah it, it was not the boom of the 80s no not by a long shot so it's a it's a brilliant idea New Nightmare I will say and me and Buddy talked before I came I don't think this would change my ranking because I've seen it multiple times but New Nightmare is the only one I didn't rewatch before I did this podcast so Maybe I'll eat my words in a couple of years. I'm going to rewatch it soon just for the sake of doing it. Maybe we'll do a new a podcast pretty soon and I'll, eat, I'll be like, I'm wrong. <laughs> I'll bow down. I'll bow down to the master. I'll bow down to this. But um, I think it stands pretty firm. And even ranking it this quote unquote low, it's a good film. 
it's a really good film. I like the story. I like the idea. But it's like I think probably it had. I watched it after every other one, and I'm so indoctrined into the other parts of Freddy that I like, and the fantasy, and the horror, and the serious stuff where. It just happened to be the last film, basically, in the original series, and it just didn't register with me as much as the other ones. I got you. So, I know you're a big fan, so... We'll get to it, but yeah. We'll get to it? All right, you don't want to talk about it right now, huh? Uh, I mean, I mean, I can see where, like, where you're coming from, I guess. Um, I obviously have a different opinion about it, just like you are going to have a different opinion about my number seven... Okay, you're one right, that you that. might be a little upset about. That's all right. Um, I, I feel like I, maybe this is the number that we both upset each other slightly, or maybe this is it. So my number seven is a Nightmare on Elm Street four, The Dream Master, which I know is one of your favorites. It is, but I'm okay and again, with it, that. it's weird having because it's there's only nine films, so having it at like the bottom tier is like weird. But there's only so many yeah, slots. Yeah. I guess Nightmare. I don't. I don't hold this series as much as I really do like it. I sound like it. I've said this a couple times. Like, I, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, but it's not Friday the 13th or Halloween to me, basically, even. I mean, it's it's just a little, it's like a tier below that. So, right. like, I get, you know, some people like comedic Freddy, mm-hmm. or they don't realize they do, but that's all they remember, the one-liners and this and that, calling everything bitch and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> I will say, side note, I did not realize how many times he called someone bitch in the series until I rewatched, especially the later ones in the series. He calls people bitch a ton in five and Freddy's dead mm-hmm. a lot. I'm like, holy shit. Like, yeah. like five, six, seven, eight times a film. He's so, got to pop the crowd, dude. He's gotta. He, he was, pop, I, he'd be popping me if I saw it in a theater, if I yeah. was, if I was old enough, but anyways, go ahead. Um, so this is of course from 1988 and the sequel to dream warriors. Right. Um, a lot of the Dream Warriors actually carry over into this film, but they, spoiler, they kill all of them off. <laughs> um, uh, like, almost, like, they kill all of them off before they kill off any of the new characters. Well, okay, so I just rewatched this, obviously, and I actually watched half of this, fell asleep, and then, uh, I'll say her name, Marissa came over, the person I'm talking to, and she wanted to watch four. So I rewatched. I saw the first half of four twice recently. Okay. So Kincaid and Joey are the ones that are left. Kincaid, Joey, and then obviously Kristen. Mm-hmm. So I guess yeah, almost half of them live from three. I mean, spoiler if if you're this deep and you haven't seen them, I guess you're you're an idiot. But uh, just being honest, not to throw viewers away, but they live. And I will say that I forget or always forget how fast they kill the other ones and maybe you're gonna shine some light on this but i was disappointed i'm like well it's a classic example of taking something from a previous film like what was left off on and then just eradicating it as soon as fucking possible yeah a lot of sequels do this to films in all genres and it's kind of, it kind of sucks sometimes. Like, I will say, like I, I'm a big fan of four. We're gonna hear about more about it from me, but well, they recast the one girl. They recast so, Kristen. Part of me is like, why even have them in there then? Why not come up with a new idea? They could have start them fo- live, like you know what I mean. Just let them be. Like Kincaid and Joey could have just lived. Yeah, normal like they didn't lives, have to be in the know? film yeah, at all. Yeah, like which I so. It's cool that they're in there, but I don't like the way that they were utilized. Same. I, um, I agree that 100%. Um, there are a few scenes in this. The, the My main problem, and this is why it's at the seven spot for me, is that there's only, like, two really, like, memorable parts in the film for me. One is the classroom scene, clearly. Great scene. Um, and the other one is the, the waterbed bloody... Bath. That's very memorable. You're telling me the cockroach scene is not memorable to you? Honestly, I don't even remember it right now. Dead ass. I haven't seen it since March, but I, I don't remember what you're talking about now. To me, it's just a very... And here's why... So five, very memorable. Remember everything that happens in five. Here, 
it's just not memorable to me, at okay. least. I don't know why. You don't remember the kung fu? Uh, okay, so I remember. So doing the research for this, I remembered the kung fu scene because they were talking about it in the research. And this is why I feel like part five had the advantage, but for some reason it didn't come to be. So part four, they were making this film during the 80s writer's strike. Oh. So most of these scenes and these sequences, they were coming up with the day of. Maybe I did know this. Maybe I did. Maybe I do. Maybe I have heard. So and like and originally they weren't even going to have that character die. But they had filmed his death scene, his, like, funeral scene prior to that. So they had to get, like, a death scene out of it. So they're like, fuck it, we don't even know what to do, so we're just gonna have him fight nothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I didn't even remember that scene until I was looking stuff up for that today. Okay. Um, for me, it was just, maybe it was be just because I was watching them all at once, and they kind of blended together. But for this one, it was just like, there's so much of it that it's just gone from my memory, which in comparison to part five, I remember it because it was terrible, <laughs> a lot of it. Um, but in this one, it just, a lot of it didn't hit the mark for me either. Um, the characters aren't as memorable as they are in some of the other films, just the human characters. Um, it has some good effects, but it's also not as good as some of the effects we would see in other films. In the series, it does have a lot of good effects, but as you said, if one of your main sequences is him fighting nothing, um, it's just like, I don't know. This is the first one to me. We're going to talk about that more uh, when it gets to my slot, but this is the first one to me that had the big, because it did have a bigger budget, had the big, full set pieces. Like, it wasn't him in a small room right with a gag like one big gag it was like when they had the the kung fu scene a fully elaborate it was a dojo it was yeah. A, yeah, yeah full dojo full it was almost more like it wasn't even really a dojo it was more like a, almost like an a, traditional Asian restaurant with like an open floor plan because he was fighting on different le not levels but kind of it was tiered but I mean you could tell they spent a lot of money in the set pieces this has, and they use this set piece, uh, part of it in five, the at the finale when Alice becomes a dream master, uh, the stained glass window cathedral, like the kind of right, yeah. uh, grungy uh, stuff like that, where the series prior was more in a reality base, like reality based scenes with like one gag in it, like example, it's fine, whatever. The primetime bitch kill, you know, right, one yeah, of my favorites. Just... The and it, she's in a normal room watching TV. Goes to the t up to the TV. Freddie comes out, uh, part, grabs her. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, grabs her. That is the gag. Where this is an entire room that has stuff going in. It's 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 almost being more all encompassing. Where it almost is creating a world. Like it's not just Freddie in a scene for a kill. We're creating Freddy's world. Like, this is becoming... Right. And they do that more in 5 as well, which you had mentioned. So... I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it more with mine, but there's a lot that I like in 4. But I... I, I get it, you know? I get it. Yeah. So That's pretty much all I have to say about it, I guess. Um, also, like, sort of like the rules don't make a lot of sense, but they don't make a lot of sense in a lot of them. Like, with it, Freddy... Is he, can he be in the dream? Is he pull that, like, a lot of it, I mean, it makes more sense than it does in some of the other ones, but still, a lot of it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but yeah. All right, so we're on to your number six. Number six. I'm gonna do Freddy's Dead. Freddy's number Dead six. for your number six? That's my number six as well. All right. So we can just, we can do this together. Yeah, uh, some of these are working out, I, you know, I guess, uh. It's nice to be able to talk about the same lineup, but thank God not all of ours are the same. That'd be pretty boring, wouldn't it? Yeah. You are right, you first then on this one. Let you take the reins on this one. So this is the one where it's basically a straight up comedy <laughs> at points. This is a yeah. Which for better or worse, I guess. Yeah. Because I don't know, a lot like as you said, a lot of people remember Freddie for the one liners, for this and that. And I would rather it this movie 
is a so bad it's good movie. And yeah. I'd rather it be so bad it's good than so bad it's bad. Yeah. Um, so at least it's really fun. Um, of course, he's the Wicked Witch of the West at points. On that one in the beginning, yeah. Um, again, this one is another one that's very, very memorable. Um, I mean, Jesus Christ, the Power Glove, the whole video game sequence... Uh, um, where he's tripping on drugs even though he's just smoking weed, but apparently they think he was taking, like, the craziest yeah. acid known to mankind. Um, this one has a bunch of the one-liners that are actually, like, iconic for the series. This and Five does, and I always... I, I never remember that, like, some of the later films are the ones he's, like... He has a scene where he comes out of that basement and he's like, every town has an Elm Street. Or he's like... I am immortal. Like, you know what I mean? Right, like, the yeah, ones yeah. that the people have used for, like, T-shirts or, like... Yeah. Uh, a band I love, Iron Sheik, referenced it. Every Town is in Elm Street's one of their songs. Like, yeah, yeah. A bunch of things that have been referenced by pop culture were actually from Dream Child and Freddy's Dead. Which, like, us watching them, it's like, I don't realize that, but yet, still, we still have to realize that, like, Freddie was still he wasn't at peak four was the most successful film of the franchise but he was still like mega into pop culture at this point right. you know and I guess it just to mention it because as I said with part five this is when they stopped numbering them so this is part six um, and it's from 1991 so again during that dark period of cinema getting into the early 90s um, it was also shot in 3D um, right. Which you would never know if you're watching it nowadays. Um, the I know end. I'm, the end is the end. You can tell. Well, no, I'm just I'm just saying like now like a lot of the releases you get with it like the one I have here it doesn't even come with like the 3D glasses anymore. Right. right so like right. I know on some of the early DVDs it would have the glasses yep. included, yep, yep. but now the 3D is like completely like lost. Yep. Um, until they do some sort of box set like if they ever do what they did with Friday the Thirteenth with yep. something like this maybe it would come back. But nowadays, I mean, you're just seeing, like, the weird sperm shit coming at the screen, and it's the, like, what the, is the this? The sleep demon. The sleep, yeah, sleep demon, like, whatever. The, the They look like worms, you know? Yeah. Sperm is the best way. I mean, they <laughs> look like sperm when they're moving around. When they have that, like, mural that they're talking about them on, they look like worms, but yeah. Yeah. Um, the film is just insane. It, um, it covers, at this point in the series, and after I just rewatched all that, I just watched this two days ago, uh, you're pretty much at the point where you're like, anything can happen and I'm going to be entertained. You get to the point where you're almost like, it doesn't matter the quality <laughs> of the film. Uh, as long as Freddy is doing Freddy shit and it's enjoyable, then yes. Like, but it's straight comedy. Him kind of looking at the camera, almost winking a lot, uh, basically. Like, him... It this is like yeah like straight like straight fantasy horror I bear I, it's almost just like images of horror but it's not a horror film at all the so one thing that I do think gets a little overshadowed because a lot of the film is so ridiculous it does have like some creepy parts in it too like when Freddy is not Freddy Krueger when he is like before he gets possessed and it's like showing the flashbacks yeah. of him like killing his wife and like about yeah, to kill his daughter yeah there are some yeah. Um, yeah. so I, but I do think that gets overshadowed by the absurdity of the rest of it. Um, but the film is, it's, it's a riot yeah. through the whole thing yeah. pretty much. Um, like I said, I mean, the, the video game scene is probably the most memorable thing out of all of it with the power glove, um, and it, all that kind of stuff. It's, and it, it's funny cause it takes 10 years, 10 years later than the other films, like at the end of five. So it's almost like a post-apocalyptic Freddy right. film. Right, yeah. Because uh, Springwood doesn't have any children in it anymore because Freddy killed all of them. Yeah. And, like, the uh, the parents are, like, delusional, psychotic, almost like in a hypnosis. Like, they go to that town, like, the scene where they're having the town fair and the kids from the uh, city over uh, that are in that youth shelter are, like, there because they snuck on the... the uh, Van mm -hmm. and like the main counselor is bringing the main kid, the main character who has like amnesia back to Springwood to figure out what happened. Yeah, uh, and they're in that town fair, and people are like riding the bumper carts by themselves because there's no kids, or they're like touching the kids, like, 
oh, I'll take good care of you this time. I won't, I won't take my eyes off you. Like, all this stuff. It's like, Roseanne is in it. Rose, yeah, I was going to... Tom but, Arnold is in it at the... Alice Cooper is, Alice Cooper. is Freddy's dad. Yeah. Um, Johnny Depp is in it in the... In the, the Your Brain on Drugs scene. commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, so, like, there's a lot of humor in this. There's, like, a lot of in-jokes and shit like that. Um... There's the one kill that everyone references online. It's it is it's a wily e. coyote skit yeah. where where he's putting the the That's spikes why, in the yeah. road. And, and he almost like leans on it, and almost like laughs or smiles. Like yeah. it's the most tongue in cheek, winking at the camera moment. I even told uh, Marissa, I'm like, a lot of this shit is like Looney Tunes. Yeah, like it, uh, in the some of these these kills and stuff like that. Um, she really did not like the. Uh, the deaf, I think his name is Carlos, the deaf kids, his whole That's, sequence. That, that is great. I love that part. No, she likes it, but she was actually like invested, like it bothered her with like oh, the when pins he, dropping. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, hear, the uh, you know, possessed, for lack of a better term, hearing aid, all this shit. Um, it actually bothered her. She was like, oh, I couldn't watch that scene. The nails on the chalkboard. Oh, gotcha. Well, Freddie's glove on the chalkboard, but everybody knows what I mean when I say that. Um... To me, though, it's just it's just an entertaining time. There's really not a lot to say about it. Uh, I I guess I like how much of the Freddie backstory was in it, where his daughter gets her kind of comeuppance, and you you know, yeah, she actually like kills her dad, finishes Freddie, they bring him into the real world. I will say, and he just died last year. I think it was last year. Maybe it was this year. Yafet Kodo's in it, who's from... He's in the Aliens series. Right, yeah, yeah. And he's the doctor that's obsessed with sleep. And it's nice to have a character in the series that doesn't try to discredit everything the kids are saying or they don't believe it. Because a lot of the problem in this series... Not problem, but the reason a lot of kids die is because their parents are extreme 80s stereotypes. Dieting complete alcoholics completely don't listen to a word the kids say they think they can just dope them up or they're just children they'll get over it's a phase very much what everyone was harping on of like problems with like parenting and like just issues in the 80s in general you know kind of hold the diet fads and things like that and it's nice to see here that his character is like Oh no, I believe you. Like, okay, we're, I believe this shit could be real because he like researches this and he comes in, figures out how to dive into the dreams, and he's like, "We're gonna pull this fucker out. We're gonna kill him." Right. So like, he he comes in. He's just like the best adult, in my opinion, <laughs> in the whole series, um, and takes care of business. So true, true. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it that hasn't already been said. Um, it's just. Really fun, good time film, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, love when he sticks the, like, through the head with the hearing aid, when he, like, does it completely through oh, the skull. The, uh, not the hearing aid, the Q-tip. Yeah, that's why. Well, oh, through, yeah, yeah, through, yeah. It's super comedic and dumb, but it's funny, and all the gross earwax and shit on it, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to hit the top five. We're, we're into the top five right now. Um, I wonder if our top five... Well, our, no, I guess, our, it, I guess our, it can be. Our top five is not going to be the same, no. Well, not the whole top five, but I wonder if... Uh, I don't think our number five is going to be the same either. Okay. Um, but you can go ahead with yours. Mine's Freddy versus Jason. Okay, so that's my number four. Okay. All right. um, We're close on this, then. Um, this is hard for me, because we said we were going to put it in the, seri- in the series, because... Yes, it says Freddy versus Jason, but to me this feels like a night or a Friday the Thirteenth film all the way. It's very hard for me to. It just feels like Freddy is the supporting character. I I sense. will say when I when I brought these DVDs down to do this podcast, I do keep the Freddy versus Jason with the rest of the Friday the Thirteenths. Okay. At the end. Well, then whether you meant to or not, you probably feel slightly the same way with me. Um, I think it's just because it's more alphabetical, because it's Friday, oh, Friday, and oh, Friday, and Friday. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I get what you're saying. I mean, Freddy is a big part in this, too. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say, because it's also weird, because I don't know. 
and like the reason we're including this is because I mean, shocker, eventually we're going to be doing the Friday the Thirteenth ones. Um, so it's gonna be weird to see like where they stack up within each franchise. And I like that because you brought that point up to me prior to the podcast. So, in terms of Nightmare on Elm Street, it's towards the top. Um, for both of us, yours more yeah. in the middle. Um, but when we do that one, who knows? It could be towards the bottom. It could be one of the best. I mean, we don't know. Again, it's it's hard because the first half of the film is Freddy convincing Jason to either kill for him or to open stuff back up so Freddy can get new victims. So it's almost like Freddy is the boss and Jason's yeah. just doing what he's being told so I feel like the whole film is a Friday the 13th film almost featuring Freddy in a sense um, even obviously the end even though you get that Freddy wink at the end with the head I won't, I'm, I'm spoiling it but I'm sure we'll talk about it more but it I, I don't know I, uh, I probably will tell the story of me seeing this on the Friday the 13th podcast because okay the Friday the 13th we mentioned to you is... It might have to be a two-parter. That's probably going to be a long... To be honest... <laughs> it's a it's, lot of films. It's, it's a, a lot, lot of films. To it's go probably yeah. going to be the lo- one of the longer ones. So I will tell the story then. I have a very memorable story. Uh, I think I might have even told part of it on another podcast with you. Because I it's one of my like most memorable theater experiences. Actually, this just came out 18 years ago, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so it was in 2018. Jesus Christ, that sounds sounds yeah. like a long time. It doesn't feel like, that uh, long. Wait, yeah, it, yeah, 2003. 2003. Yeah, summer, and it was end ten, of summer 2003. So it was 10 years after it was teased um, in Jason Goes to Hell, which right. was in 1993. Right. Of course, at the end of that film, the glove comes out of the sand and pulls yeah. Jason's mask underneath. I just told this whole thing to Marissa. I explained oh, yeah. it's funny. 10 years, yeah, it's funny, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, 10 years later, we finally get Freddy vs. Jason after a lot of rumors, speculation, and a lot of hype behind it. Yeah. Um, because besides, I mean, there was New Nightmare that came out after this. 94. And there was Jason X, but then that was it for a while. So this was... There's three, three years between Jason X and Freddy vs. Jason, right? It came out that late? I think, wasn't Jason X in 2000? Was it really? Hey, well... Let's look it up real quick. Hit the hit the the knowledge. We're so prepared, everyone. I just want everyone to know we're constantly prepared. I would have known if if this was the Friday the thir- two thousand one. Okay, so I only guess, two so years. only two only years. Two years. Wow, but, it, but it had been a long time since Freddy had been around. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It was uh, nine years. Nine yeah. years in between a Freddy between yeah. that. So, um, and the thing, the biggest part of it, you talked about, it been teased for a decade. It took a decade for it to come to fruition. Yeah. So. Uh, I feel like we're gonna we're gonna double dip on this eventually like we kinda mentioned, so it's a fun ass film. The kills are hilarious. It's very much a product of its time, the early two thousands, like all the styles, some of the jokes, some of everything. But because the, I went and watched this as I was getting in high school, <clears throat> you know, kind of like one of those like coming of age things where it's yeah. like getting to see this in a theater and like I said, I'll tell the story probably on the night or on the Friday the thirteenth one, but uh yeah, definitely middle of the road for the Nightmare on Elm Street series, I feel like. Yeah. I think the film's great. Again, it's a ton of fun. I mean, it, Freddy's plan sort of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No. Because he's trying to get Jason to kill all these people, but then he gets pissed that he's killing, killing too, too many, many people. people. Yeah, so... It, <laughs> it's like, I don't know what he got thought he was getting himself into. I, um... I like the look of the film a lot. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. Miles knows I'm a big color palette yeah, guy. I agree. I love the look of the film too. Um, so. I mean, all of Freddy's shit's red. All of Jason's shit's blue. Yeah. Um, the film just looks great. It's got a sleek look to it. It does. Um, I think it's one of the better like versus films when like you have like two franchises because I mean you have Alien versus Predator. Oh, right. we have Godzilla versus Kong now, like yeah. the new one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Allegedly, they were going to make a sequel to this. I know the story behind this, actually. Then go ahead. They were supposed to do, and they've done this in the comic format, Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash, which when you think about it... So there's another one, too, and I'll tell that after this. ...is hilarious. That was very close to happening, but 
Sam Raimi wanted to do and never gave, I don't know the exact story, but never gave the rights. And the whole J-Horror remake wave killed that from ever happening. That was supposed to happen, but as you know, the ring popped off. The Grudge remake, which Sam Raimi did, Mm -hmm. um, and sequels and like all the other, there was like two to three years where there was nothing... There were other horror films. I mean, Saw started to pop off right at the end of that. But the whole change in the horror market. There were new, the, the new the new kids were on the block. It was yeah, all about it was yeah. all about Jigsaw and Freddy and Jason were just like, all right, yeah, forget. Jigsaw and Asian creepy Asian horror. Yeah, and it just it was done. But allegedly, forever. there was another idea where it was supposed to be Freddy versus Jason versus Pinhead. I've also heard where I've also they heard basically it pulls him into the Cenobites realm somehow at the end or um, at the end of this one is explained that like they both die somehow. Yeah. Um, I, like, I don't know too much information about it, but that was another thing they were supposed to do. Michael Myers was never part of it. No, they were like, no. Um, but it was, so it was just like weird. It was like, all right, we're going to do Pinhead now. But, but they did do the comics for Freddy vs. Yeah. Jason vs. Ash. So, I mean, they eventually got part of the story they wanted to talk about across. Yeah. But goddamn, goddamn rings and the ring and all the ring and the grudge. I love those films, but I would have really probably, all of us probably, if we could be talking about, the film would probably maybe be 15 years old now, maybe this year, if they did do Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash. Could you imagine? It would definitely here's, be a guaranteed cult classic. Here's guaranteed. the thing. Here's here's the thing. Why not do it now? They Robert England has one more in him. Yeah. Bruce Campbell's still going strong. They're making that new film. He just did the whole Ash vs. Evil Dead series. They're making yeah. the new film. Yeah. Why? I mean, you can get anyone to play Jason. Yeah. I mean, why not do it now? It would probably do insane numbers even just even if they did like the whole hbo or one of the streaming things come on people would know a mile away it'd be hilarious could you imagine bringing the evil dead ass like jason's walking through the woods and a tree's trying to fuck him and he just flexes at it and cuts it in half with a machete or a deadite comes up and he just grabs it and rips it completely in half and stares at it I would seriously be like this if I watched Jason grab a deadite and rip it head to toe completely in half. I'd be like, "This is the greatest moment in cinematic history." Has you, then, have you read the comic? Does that happen I, in the comic? I haven't. No, I'm. And this is just me as like a fan. Imagine Jason walking up to the cabin. Imagine they being like, "Oh, the cabin was near Crystal Lake," and he right, crosses yeah, yeah. over, and he's just like, and the deadites are there, and they're like. <laughs> And, and Jason just seriously, like, not even face, walks up, <laughs> rips him in half, cutting cutting demonic vines up, punching fucking... Imagine him punching a Deadite's head off. And then Ash just shows up, and he's like, well, what the fuck is going on here? And, like, you know... Ash is just like, thanks for taking yeah. care of that. And Jason seriously just looks at Ash, and he's like, what the fuck is that? The guy with the chainsaw... Yeah. Imagine if they just dabbed up and were like, all right, bro. And they just yeah. fought fucking like a hundred deadites or <laughs> yeah. something insane. That would actually probably be bad, but I would also mark out at that too. Both scenarios I would mark out at, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah, so who knows? Maybe by this time next year when we do the, uh, the next one, we'll know if they'll make it. If not, I mean, give us the green light. I mean, fuck it. I mean, we clearly have all the ideas here. Um, so that was my number four, um, but going back to my number five, um, one of Miles' favorite ones in the franchise, um, for me, it's in the middle. I don't think it's quite as good as Freddy vs. Jason, um, but I think this is the one I had the biggest change of opinion on. I've talked about this in other shows, um, but Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, um, comes right in the middle for me. Um, this one revolves a new family living in the house. Um, of course, the kid in there finds Nancy's diary in the bedroom. I don't know why that was, it was just literally just on a normal shelf in the bedroom. I don't know how they overlooked that. A lot of 80s films had, if you look back across all different stories, not even horror, had the most coincidental plot points where there's like, oh, I just happened to open this door and it led to this insane secret. Or like, you know, if you watch, it's like, the Goonies or things like that. Like the most coincidental shit that nowadays you'd be like, well, how the fuck could that ever happen? There's no yeah. way. Anyways, yeah. go ahead. 
Um, I'm not going to go too much on it because we'll talk about it more when you do yours. Um, but I like the idea, like, they didn't establish all of the Nightmare on Elm Street, like, lore at this point because it's just the second film. Right. So a lot of it is a lot more psychological um, than I had remembered it when I first watched it, like, years back. Because years back, I thought the film was, like, terrible. Um, but now... I think it's actually, like, genius in a lot of ways. Like, because obviously now we know that Freddy has been in all these films. He takes over your dreams, da-da-da-da-da. In here, there was only the first film that was out. Yeah. Um, so who knows? Is this kid getting possessed by Freddy, or is he just nuts? And he's yeah. doing all these yeah, murders. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that has a lot going for it. Um, and yeah, the only thing, like, for me, like, it's not as crazy because like the next one like part three is when you really started to get like the elaborate like sequences even though in four and five it goes like completely like off the wall like in this one there's not as much stuff this, going it's more based in reality that's, because yeah. it's yeah. freddy is possessing this kid it's not really in the dreams so a lot of the kills are happening in the real world like with the gym teacher and his like, his whole house is, like, He's, melting because it's turning into a boiler room. So, like, bur his pet bird explodes and stuff also, like that. He also is losing... One of the things that I will say about it, it, do, it is happening more in the real world, but he's also losing track of if he is dreaming or if this is happening. Right. So, it really crosses the lines of, is he awake right now? Is he, you know, what's going on? Not, but there's. I feel like this one has one of the best branching stories where there is. Is he awake? Is he asleep? Is he possessed? Uh, even just adding the diary or the little things they find out about Freddy. I think a lot of the plot points in this film, why I like it so much, is because it's so different than all the other Nightmare on Elm Street ones. And I feel like all of the payoffs and all of the plot points actually work really well in in just in the film and in the lore up to that point yeah and it, it's just a little weird because like it is sort of like the transitional film yes between this the more serious first part and then part three where it sets off the chain of events where it gets more ridiculous this one is like in the middle like as you this said is still a horror f this is a horror film one and two to me are horror films Three is a horror film, but you start to see those fantastic elements. And, I mean, welcome to primetime, bitch. The more one-liners and stuff. Where Freddy in this is a little bit more minimal. This might be more... more I hate to say that, because there's... Obviously, there's the big backyard barbecue scene. It's one of my favorite in the series yeah. as well. But besides that, there is a lot of uh, minimalistic horror in this, or the dream stuff. But even know? in this with, like... Specifically, like, the dream sequences. This is the transitional piece. Because in the first one, sometimes you really can't tell if he, you're dreaming or awake. And right, the only, right, like, right, right. context clue would be, like, okay, she ran from this room and now she's outside. That doesn't make any sense. Right, Like, right. that's how you know it's in a dream. Right. Whereas in part three, once you take that jump, you always know when you're in the dream. Yeah. There's never a point where you're guessing there whether or a, not this is actually there happening. There's just the one... I feel like this might be, if we're talking about the moment when the franchise changes not the second one but when they do the we're jumping around a little but we're talking about this as a whole in the series when they do the group hypnosis and they're sitting there and they all think they fell asleep and woke up and then they have that I wish my terminology was better but the thing you see in a lot of therapists like generic therapy offices where they have the balls that bounce back and forth right, from, yeah, yeah. from that where they bounce it and they all scatter and go off into the room and they're floating and they realize they're in a dream. And from, I think from that point in the series, you always... I feel like that is the changing point where everything after that, you know you're in a dream. Right. The second half of three and then from, from that, you're like, oh, they're dreaming. We're in the dream. We're in almost... We're in the know. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, like, it feels weird because it's only number five on the list. But from here on, like, these are all, like, from what, I, in my personal opinion, I think that all of these, the top five are great films. Like, I love part two. It's just weird that that's where it ranks on the thing is number five. Like, it sounds bad. So, like, I don't want to 
feel like it's coming off like I don't think it's good because I actually really love part two a lot after rewatching it. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think it's just hard because as anyone's talked about, it's in between two of the three Wes Craven films. Yeah. It's almost a death. It's almost a death slot without knowing it. Like, yeah. Cause obviously they didn't know in part three, he was going to come back and do it. So like, it's just weird. I yeah. feel like if we would have seen it when they came out and when it was in theaters, we would, everyone would have enjoyed like, I think us is how we like films and how we like stories. We've enjoyed a lot more because there was no, we didn't hear about how good three was, or we didn't hear about the right. other ones. Like it was just coming out as, as they were released. Yeah. Right, yeah. So yeah. I think we as, as, as horror fans would have liked it a lot more initially, you know? Right. Yeah. All right. So my number four then is that how we're, yeah, we're on your number four. Okay. Well, Speaking of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street three, this is where uh, this is where I'm at. Nightmare okay, Nightmare on Elm Street three. This is where the franchise gets hard for me because the first four films sometimes can switch order. Because I, I I really do feel that the first four are all amazing. Like, I mean, Freddy vs. Jason's amazing. I just but I just kind of talked about in my opinion, it's more of a Friday the Thirteenth film. Where like these four, these are the Freddy. Nightmare on Elm Street films. Like, to me, this is right. the franchise, in a sense, for, for lack of a better, you know, whatever. Um, three... Three, to me, is a very, very, very good film. The story is there. Nancy is back, which obviously is horror fans. I mean, I have a, a tattoo that says, Final Girls Always Win. I'm a big fan of, of Final Girls and, and them... Uh, getting their comeuppance, um, them being main characters. Uh, it's really good. Uh, the, the whole Dream Warrior aspect, I think, is actually brilliant, and it's a cool idea. And all of them having powers and all these things that they can fight in the dream. Nancy uh, being introduced to Kristen, kind of passing the torch. This is a passing of the torch film from one main character to what it's going to be the new main final girl, you know, whatever. It's cool. It's great. Um, I, I just, I'm not sure really what else to say that, I mean, Wes Craven kills it, kills it, directing it. This to me is the transitional film. You know, as you said, two is a transitional film, but you start to get the comedic elements here and there plays with the fantasy elements. Obviously, the one kid becomes a wizard at one point and has the yes. things. And, but it doesn't have the big set pieces to back up right. what they're trying to do. Like that scene takes place like in an alley. In a hall. Yeah, like, it's basically it, in a yeah. long hallway with, the, with that, like, uh, the wheelchair. Because he's, he's, you know, in his dreams, he's a wizard, but he can also walk. But he's, not, right. I hate to use the word crippled, but he crippled, disabled. He can't walk anymore. So, stuff like that. Um, the very iconic scene, one of the best in the series, with the one woman that is a former drug user, and Freddy comes out, and they're in that dark 80s alleyway. I really love it. It has the neon lights, gritty back alley. Right. And he comes up, and she's trying to fight him with the switchblades, and he pulls up the big smile. I feel like this is one of the first times that you see Freddy's... It's sad, because I love to, but I don't remember him doing this. like his hands become something else, right? You know what I mean? How his yeah, hands become yeah. like a different, becomes a syringes full of drugs. And I feel like this is one of the moments where it's one of the first real comedic moments. He sticks his fingers into her arms and she has the open like wound, like almost like a mouth, which I thought was incredible. One of, also one of my favorite effects in the series where they're like moving the mouse, like yeah. give us drugs, basically give us drugs, like feed us, like give us our fix. Freddy sticks all his fingers. So that was just amazing. All right in her arms. And then he's like, acts like he's getting high or almost like he's getting off. Like it's almost yeah. sexual. And I feel like that is one of the first like fully, it's dark, very dark humor, but like fully comedic yeah. Freddy moments. But I mean, I'm sure you're going to talk about this film more, but go ahead. Yeah, I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, do you want to just move on to my number three? And then we'll... We'll pick things... Because obviously, besides one of them, all of the films have been talked about already. Okay. Um, my number three is actually going to be Wes Craven's New Nightmare. 
And it's hard because this and my number two, which shouldn't be that hard to figure out what my number two is at this point. Um, I like them both almost equally, but I consider this one a little bit more disconnected from the franchise than everything else. I so that, yeah. I debated putting New Nightmare at number two. And, oh, the, wow. and the reason I didn't is because when I think of Nightmare on Elm Street, this is never the film that comes to mind. Right. right. Um, it's just something so incredibly different. It's really not even the same Freddy in the film. No, that's a thing. Because, yeah. okay, so this film is about them making a new Nightmare on Elm Street film. Wes Craven plays himself. Um, Heather plays Nan- or Heather plays herself. Yeah, Heather Lane Nancy. Can't- um, and Robert England is not only the fake Freddy in the film, but himself as Robert England, the actor, yeah. and Freddy, the ancient demonic presence right, right, that's right, in right, this film. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things in this very film. Very meta. Very meta. It's right? very, very meta. I love it a lot. Um, but again, I can't say it's the second best nightmare film because it's not even, it's just so different than that's everything why it's else. That's Wes Craven's new nightmare. It's right. almost its own entity. Yeah. You know? So, um, but you, you had it like number seven on your list. Um, and this is part seven, technically, from 1994. Um, I love pretty much everything about this film, except I think the ending is horrendous, which yeah. is, which is also another reason why I can't justify putting it at number two. Um, spoiler, when they're like in, fi- they're in hell, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Freddy's getting like caught on fences and shit. Like, yeah. it makes absolutely zero sense at all. Um, I think the ending is absolutely atrocious. Um, but everything else in the film I love a lot. I Obviously, I'm big into films. I am a filmmaker. And one of my guilty pleasure genres of film are movies about making movies. Right. Um, you can pretty much throw anyone at me, and I love it. Once Upon a Time <laughs> in Hollywood. Right. Um, right. The original King Kong is yeah. a movie about making a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's just something that I really, really love, that genre of film. Um, I like that it does have some jokes in it too, but for the most part, it's taken very seriously. Very, yeah. There's very. a lot of meta moment. There's a lot of like psychological, like talk, like Wes Craven as himself in the film is like, well, you're going to have to become Nancy in real life. And like all this stuff, he's like, I'm writing it as it's happening. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. 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 Um, there's just like a lot of like, I don't want to say mystery, but there's like a lot of like it, things are unfolding and you're not, I don't know. It's a very genius film in a sense and uh, you know kind of why I had it much lower is because you kind of nailed it on the head which could be for me it went one way for you went the other it's not a very Nightmare on Elm Street film in my opinion but for you you probably love it even more because of that fact because it's so different right so but it's 94 when he's basically they're all playing themselves and it's obviously it I feel like Scream This is the stepping stone to get, to get him to scream. Scream. So I feel like this is both of those films back to back are so insane, so genius, so iconic in a sense, that people probably don't give New Nightmare Era the credit for that, but this time in his career's filmography, I feel like it's probably ridiculous for him to sit there and be like I'm going to write the most meta shit before anyone... Some people have done it, but not not on the platform that he had or the right. scale that he had. In the middle of horror being at one of the lowest lows in mainstream history. Right. So, it, he... I, I, I respect the film, I think, more than I like the film. Right. Because it is... And I do like... It. That's the whole, the whole thing with this whole top films of this... Even being at number seven, I still really like it. Right. It's yeah. not like to me, honestly, I don't know about you, but the bottom two is kinda like, oh, those are all right. <laughs> and then the rest of them like right. yeah. I really like these films, you know, regardless, but we have to rank them. You get they somehow. gotta fall somewhere. Yeah, they gotta yeah. fall somewhere. So uh but I do think this film and these like four to five years in his career between probably initially writing New Nightmare and Scream and so on, I mean, it completely changed the course of his you know, career. This, to me, yes, he has Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes, he has other films. But this, 
you know, this and then going into stream helped him become a real, like, legend. Like, I mean, right, yeah. it wasn't just a one-hit wonder with a few other cult classic films. Right, I mean, you had people under the stairs, you had, like, yes. stuff like that. But nothing, even when he did, like, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, it didn't reach the level that he would get when he finally got to Scream. Scream became an entire... There was a five-year period after that with the whole teen horror. He basically started an entire horror boom based on one film. Right. You know, I mean, he had, you know, some very prolific, crazy years between the 80s and the 90s. Like, it was different decades where he was having the success, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, I don't have too much else to say about it other than, you know, what we've already talked about, so. So, we're on to mine. So, I feel like now we're kind of getting that, you kind of know process what of, pr- Process of elimination, elimination yeah. yeah. So, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, uh, The Dream Master, I love this film. I love, this film drips the 1980s to me more than almost any of them. The kung, f- there's a lot of music in this film, and I especially when I rewatch it. There's a lot of scenes that have a lot of music over it. The whole working out in the garage kung fu scene, um, the whole there's punks in this film or people skateboarding like mm-hmm. the whole high school culture. Uh, the set pieces start to get more fantastic, bigger budget. The whole opening where she's back in the like the boiler room and like going through and she's like brings Kincaid and Joey in. She's like Freddy's alive and all that stuff, and like almost brings Kristen's character almost brings Freddy back to life. She there's a lot of negatives in this film too. When I rewatched, I'll, <laughs> no, I'm being honest. Like I'll admit, I love this film for what it is, but there's a lot of things that this is the turning point that becomes the later part of the series. Uh, them killing off Joey and Kincaid so early it was like every time I watch it but this time especially so disappointing to me um, the fact that Kristen became the new final girl just to basically be upstage and replaced partway through the film like you said it's you know they're rewriting the script doing certain things but I feel like her portrayal from three to four uh bothers me even though I'm ranking four above three but both of them to me are can be almost hit or miss usually I always rank four above it but when I watched three this time and four I was like god damn they're so close you know they're so fucking close for me like I'm like ah but I think it just has more of the 80s I mean I was born in the 80s I wasn't raised in the 80s but like has a lot of the 80s nostalgia that I love Peak Freddy, where there's still a little bit of horror, but he starts putting comedy in. I mean, had more heavy comedy. Right, yeah. But I think the balance is still de- somewhat decent on this. Uh, I love the finale when Alice... And this is why I get pissed with Alice in 5, because Alice in 4 is so <laughs> fucking good compared to Alice in 5. But she has all of her friends' like energy, has Kristen's power to jump into dreams... She's owning herself, owning her character, uh, and she just goes and... I mean, actually, it's the first time you see someone fully fight Freddy in a dream. One-on-one, a versus, a real versus match, um, and it has that, you know, that whole, like, Freddy Cathedral almost for the back of, like, or lack of a better term, like the stained glass, the big stained glass thing, and they're fighting in there, and they're they're running in the church pews and it's you know it's it's fantastic um i really like that uh probably obviously my favorite for the later films like i feel like they tried to go more insane with the effects and recreate some of the things but i feel like the writing and directing just wasn't there after this obviously even i like freddy's dead a lot but it just wasn't yeah they just couldn't pull off the things that they were in my opinion pulling off before right and like in my opinion, like, as as we talked about, like, they were coming up with a lot of this shit, like, on the spot. So, like, it is commendable, like, what they were even actually able to pull off. Um, right. Which is why, to me, part five even is more, like, disappointing, because at that point, they had their shit together. Yeah, you know? Alice, Alice was a badass dream master. 
and stuff. Yeah, that's the thing. Like in her character, like I said, in five, she's just worried about Freddie and telling all of her friends about Freddie, which she should have known was then gonna kill them because Fred. Like it just right. Her character, Kristen. It's it's hard because Nancy's character is amazing. Nancy's character is incredible. Kristen should have not died in four for me. She should have kind of like her and Alice should have teamed up, in my opinion, whooped Freddy's ass and done that because Kristen became a full dream warrior. Nancy almost coached her. Yeah. She should have lived through four, trained Alice, died at the beginning of five, like shocked the audience, had like a big, some sort of big thing with Freddy, died completely at the beginning of five. Then that gives Alice her one movie to right. be everything and also kind of get maybe a nice comeuppance at the end instead of being a minor character in her own story at the end of five. Exactly. So it it's hard because I think Nightmare on Elm Street compared to all the other franchises, the big ones, has the most missed opportunities. What do you think about that? I agree. It 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 adds I, I think when even you compare it to the other three well, the other two main franchises it's unquestionably the weakest yeah um nightmare on elm street has better films than you would see when you get into some of the friday sequels but like when you look at all the series like as a whole nightmare is the bottom of the top three i i think too because a lot of the other films i i'm lumping texas chance i'm adding more than a right. top three but you know i think that a lot of those are better standalone films where the way they've layered the characters in the story, you almost, excuse me, have to watch each of the Nightmare on Elm Streets to understand who is this woman? Who is this? What is that? Right. Whereas some of, like, Halloween to a degree, you kind of got to know what's going on. But Friday the 13th, you can just pop on whatever. As long as you know who Jason is, like, you're, 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 fine. you're good. But even, I was thinking about this actually when we were talking about earlier... Halloween, you could watch Halloween 4 and 5 together and be fine. Right. Michael Myers is some character that's coming back. There's enough, like, urban legend lore. Yeah. Even in the film, you're like, oh, I could watch 4 and 5. And like, oh, yeah, cool. Or you could watch 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. And obviously 3 is its own, not even its Michael thing. Myers film. So, and like you said, Jason, you just throw on part 6 and be like, oh, yeah, that was great. You know, like, Jason, yeah. some, some evil demonic thing getting struck by lightning, came back to life, killed people, and this guy, you know, like... It works as a standalone film. Jason goes to Manhattan. Yeah. You know, it's just his character is a little bit easier to throw into any situation. Where Freddy, the way I think the way they did it with the female characters, because Freddy's not really the focus of a lot of them. He's not the plot point. There's other plot points going on. Whereas in Friday the Thirteenth, you're there to see Jason. Yeah. In this one, there's so many like moving parts to it. Yeah. You can't just jump in to part four. And yeah. expect to know what's going you got, on. Like, who's this? Who's this Kristen chick? Why does she? Why is she being yeah. haunted by Freddy? Like you have to see it. Um, I'm a big. I, I just think I like. I like how grand four is, and I like the kills a lot. I just think it's just a little bit better film. I like the way it looks. We talked about palettes or the way mm-hmm. things are shot. I think that. Four is shot a lot better than any of the Nightmare films up to this point, to be honest. Really, especially when I just watched it, like, I really am like, man, this looks like the camera angles, the mm-hmm. shots for the effects, because I'm looking at effect shots, too. I'm like, mm-hmm. this is a really strong film, in my opinion. But, I mean, I get why people put three. It's hard. Three and four, yeah. is that, it's, that, it's, that, it's that coin toss, you know, so... yeah. So my number two is part three, obviously, Process of Elimination. Right. Dream Warriors, 1987. Um, out of the one, and like, we mentioned, again, this is the transition where the comedy is starting. This also has the best balance, I feel, between the horror and the comedy. Right. Um, where Freddy's dead, it's slapstick the whole time. Yeah. The first one, it tries to throw the jokes in here and there. This is the one where it's the perfect balance of both. Um, there's lots of varied special effects in this one. Right. Um, like for example, there's the scene where Freddy turns all claymation. Right. Um, there's right. the scene where Freddy's skeleton comes back to life, and that's all stop motion. 
um, at the end in the with the in the with the cars, it's right, the, the right, skeleton. Right. Um, there's a lot of like, I don't know. It's like homages to fucking like Harryhausen and shit. Like, yeah. there's a lot of yeah. like. Well, this whole I feel like yeah, three and four, three and four especially. It really in five, I guess too, but three to five are definitely huge special effects in film because you talked about the hammer reference, almost like. The hammer references with that big. I knew exactly because I just seen right. you talking about that. Well, because like you got to think. So like right now, for example, um, we're in a period of horror filmmaking where everything is referencing the '80s, and even right now the films are about the early '90s. Um, but like even like five, ten years ago, like I mean, you're getting Stranger Things, you're getting the remake of It, where they bump it up to modern day. In the 80s, the shit that these filmmakers grew up on, they grew up on fucking... They were monster kids, I guess. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's what... You know, so that's, what that's the shit they're going to reference. They're going to reference right. the Hammer films. I mean, Jesus, it's the same passage of time between the 80s now, so now yeah. and right yeah. then with the 40s don't, and don't 50s. Re- don't remind me. It's very yeah. sad. I, yeah, know, it's, one day we got old and the stuff that we grew up on was even older. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um... But yeah, it just has like so many iconic moments. Um, this is one I probably didn't even have to rewatch to rank it at number two. Um, Nancy, of course, is now the intern at a psychiatric hospital where all of the last of the Elm Street kids are. Yeah. Um, and that sort of, I mean, I don't want to say it's like a plot hole because I mean, like, with Halloween or whatever, yeah, he's trying to kill the rest of his family, but then Michael Myers is basically killing anyone. Yeah. And this is sort of the same thing. He's trying to kill the Elm Street kids, but then once the Elm Street kids are all dead, Freddy's in, like, part four and five, he's still going and trying to kill whoever he can. They, they did, I will say they did a good job about putting Alice in there where he even admits, he's like, go find me kids. Yeah. Like, he becomes insatiable where he's like, unsatiable, what, I, uh, my brain's not working, but y- you know what I mean. Uh, he's like, I need, like, I think he thought his character was like, oh, yeah, when I kill all the M Street kids, I fucked over all their families, everything's great. And then he's like, what do I do now? Yeah. Like, he, he feels un- like he's still He's this, not fulfilled, yeah. He's still this dream demon that constantly still is existing, immortal to his knowledge. And he's like, well, I got to kill more fucking kids. Like, what, yeah. I, he's like, yeah. what do I do? He's like, and he, so he finds a way. I will say the series is smart, depending or considering all the different writers and directors and all the changes where they're like, okay, well, yeah, we got to get Freddy more kids, so what do we do? And so Alice is that nice gateway where Kristen passes her powers off, and then Freddy figures her figures it out, and he's like, yeah, bring more kids. And then, unfortunately, her character becomes a dumbass in five and just yeah. brings her way more. Six basically doesn't even care about that. They're like, oh, you're a kid in Elm Street or, or in uh, Springwood? You're getting fucking killed by Freddy. You're five yeah. years old. Freddy's killing yeah. you in a dream. Like, it gets... It it just goes all in insane. But anyways. Yeah. Um, this is also... Because obviously part two was very, very different. Um, so this one introduces a lot of the elements that we would see in all of the later sequels. Right. Like, where the people's, like, personal interests are what is affecting the dreams. Right. That's um, true. Like, yeah, for that's example... Um... The kid who's like the dungeon master or whatever, obviously he's dreaming of wanting to be this wizard. Yeah, right, um, right, right. And like, I guess it's not really a want or a need, but the one guy is a sleepwalker. So everyone's like, oh, he's just sleepwalking again. Right. But it's actually Freddy who pulled all of his veins out of his body and is like using him like a marionette to throw him out the window. Right, right. Um, another iconic scene. Like, this one just has like too many iconic scenes to mention without going through every single one of them, which I'm not going to do. Um, obviously, we mentioned the welcome to primetime bitch scene um, because she wanted to be a famous actress. actress yeah. So, like, that ties into that. Um, this, this, this was the film. It's funny, it took till the third film, but look, Friday the thirteenth, Jason didn't have his mask till the third film. True. But it took it took till the third film to really lay the proper groundwork that the rest of the franchise, even though it went more comedic as Freddie got bigger into pop culture, they did the you know, the show, the the record, like all the, yeah. the, the you know you know, I think wasn't he dressed up and on one of the late night shows, right? Probably, yeah. yeah he's like, probably on like he, Letterman yeah, and stuff. Yeah, he's like, Might even Leno. I, I, I can't, you know, we should research this, but we're just going off the top of our heads. 
um, before he became the pop culture icon. Like, uh, basically an icon. You know, everyone knows who Freddy is. I think part four, I don't quote me on this, but I think part four is the first one where they said in the opening credits, like, Robert England as or like Robert England in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Like I think in the first three, he's not even like credited at the beginning. So I think the th- I don't think so. But so like the third one is really what put it into the pop culture well, like the I'd way said, it is. Yeah. Four was the biggest in the box office. Like that was the peak nineteen eighty eight. Four had the biggest yeah. but because Opening. of three. I mean yeah, yeah, it, be- yeah. it became right at that time, that late eighties time, like he became the icon, you know? Um, but yeah, there's not much else to say about three that we haven't talked about. I mean, Nancy's great, obviously glad to see her back. Um, that's the top three are all the Wes Craven and Nancy trilogy for me. For you. It um, makes, I mean, it makes sense. I get it. Um, so number one, not shocking to any of us. Um, both of us are having the original Nightmare on Elm Street as number one. I didn't even do number two yet. You didn't do number two? That was your number two. I didn't What do was your number two? two? I thought you just did number four. Number four is my number three. Oh, I thought that was your you number skipped, two. No, you skipped So what's your, right, num- you what's your number right two? Up. So. What haven't you said yet? So this is where the series. Oh, you didn't talk is, about. You didn't talk about. The, okay, okay. This is where the series for me. I fucked up. It's fine. No, it's fine. It's all right. The whole top four to me can be a coin toss given on the day, but it's only a coin toss between two films switching places in regards to like. My three and four were never going to be my number two. And my number one, number two were never going to be my three and number four, if that makes sense. Right. So I actually changed Here we go. my rank. No, no, uh, no, you're actually, you just, I changed my ranking actually, rewatching the films for Nightmare on Elm Street. Two always held the most special place in my heart. I don't know why. I just loved it. You know, you get attached to films, things. I mean, that's why we do this. We get attached to, you know, things we grew up on, films, the stories. I always like the characters better. I really do like the relationship between the main girl and the main boy in two. I think it's one of the best, probably the best character dynamic for me in the series because like she's trying to get to know her neighbor and trying she's like interested in him. He's going through all the psychological terror. Freddy's whatever. He's starting at a new school or what or starting mm-hmm. at a new like I really re- like related or really enjoyed their dynamic. I think it is the strongest in the series still. Um I know I'm not Nancy's a stronger character than both of them, but their symbiotic relationship right, yeah. I think is the most natural and most organic where like Kristen and her boyfriend, they kill Kristen so early into four, it really doesn't give things time to develop. They don't get the whole film to develop into something that I can get behind, you know? But it's a coin toss on any given day, but I would say on the average day, I'd be like, I like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 the most because of the effects, the story with them. I love I love being him pulled into reality because it's different. Mm-hmm. I mean, they read they do it in the end of Freddy's Dead, but it took them years later yeah, to yeah. redo that. Um, I like all the internal conflict, everything. I love to. I watch one and two, and I decided to put number two as my number two. Actually, uh, yeah. for right now, that's how I'm going to rank And it. I apologize. I thought, because we talked about tar- part two for so long when I was talking right. about it, I forgot that we didn't even bring it up on yours No, yet. no, I tried to avoid. Yeah, no, I tried to. Uh, Nightmare on Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. Absolutely love this film. This would probably still be, if someone was like, yeah, go throw Nightmare on Elm Street on, I'd probably throw Freddy's Revenge on. Because... I just love the character dynamic like I just talked about with mm. the main people. It has the dad from uh, Return of the Living Dead in it is the dad. Mm-hmm. Clue Ga- yeah, Clue Gallagher. Uh, and he's hilarious. He's always hilarious in the handful of films he's been in. Um, the Flaming Bird. Or, you know, everything. All these little, like... It looks like an Andy Warhol. His house turns into, like, that 
the melting clocks, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where uh, it only it's records, and then, yeah, the bird He explodes. has the crazy yeah. dance scene that he's, like, the microphone. It's just, like, there's so many. The pool scene, I like this one because it has the final scenes are in the boiler room. Like, it actually takes place, I guess I would say, more in Freddy's world or more the world they try to establish in the first film. Right. So, I love that end. I love the dynamic where I... Off the top of my head, I can't remember the, the characters' names. I feel bad, but if you've seen the film, you know what I mean. The main woman, who is the neighbor of the main character, is constantly trying to get him to come back to the real world. To come, like, come back to him. Be with me. We'll beat Freddy. We'll take care of this together. She constantly is like, I'm in this with you. We're going <laughs> to yeah. fucking make... All the way until the end, when they actually do, like, she... She's an amazing character to counterpart his character. Very supportive, very like, we're going to figure this out together. And I love that. Um, so I really like that dynamic. It has the like really funny school bus. Almost oh, like, yeah. <laughs> almost a prelude to the later fantasy stuff. Because this set piece is bigger than any of the ones they really use in 3, to be honest. Where like it has the tires, yeah. yeah where it had and it has the school bus and that whole like, just the ground falls out from under. It's basically on the, a pillar of stone, and yeah. you know, Freddy's the driver, and it kind of adds yeah. a little bit of. The, you see the first sprinkle of humor in the series, but I love Freddy's makeup in this film. I think it's the best in my opinion. In my, I like it the best. I guess I could say. Freddy also has some few few scenes where he has the red, blood red contacts. I don't know if you mm. remember that. I think that makes him look the most terrifying. I would have used those blood red contacts for the rest of the series. Because I think it makes him look more demonic, makes him look more supernatural, otherworldly. I love the character choices of Freddy in this film. And just the kills, everything. Love this film. I don't know. That's, that's all I'm gonna say. And the more I think of the more I think about part two, the more I like part two. Yeah. Um, like I said, like when I first watched it when I was younger, I thought it was terrible. I don't know why, um, but rewatching it, it, it's very good, very underrated, um, very overshadowed because it's in between the two Juggernaut films. One it and is. Three. It's, it's just it's just a bad. It has the death slot. So early, early in the podcast, it's almost a death slot for yeah. for the for the franchise. I mean. But, it ha- I mean, it has great moments. I mean, Freddy literally bursts out of Jesse's chest. Yeah. And that one scene it has some great special effects. The pool scene, even though it doesn't make a lot of sense, it's great. The thing is, like, sometimes in horror, like, especially last, like, we, we talked about how, like, jokey Freddy says, like, sometimes you just have to appreciate what the fuck they were trying to do. Like, Freddy, Freddy's out, he's slashing. If there was ever going to be a scene where Freddy was a slasher, this was a slasher film, it'd be that. He's going to... Yeah. slashing kids down by the pool he lights the uh, the shrubbery on fire there's that kind of scene where yeah. he raises his hands in the air and he literally looks like to me like Satan himself where he's like enjoying the yeah. chaos he's creating I think, it's, I think it's hilarious that that pool scene that the one guy is actually trying to like calm him down right <laughs> so it sometimes when I think about that I'm like I wonder if that was something they decided like spur of the moment some of the some of the stuff on that where I'm like is this a good idea? Like a character, like, well, let's see if someone actually tried to like stop, <laughs> try to be rational, <laughs> rational with Freddy Krueger. Uh, I like how he bursts through the, the, uh, fence and it just burns a hole oh, yeah. where his body is. Like, yeah, there's just little subtleties in this film that I absolutely love, but I guess we're on a, both it's na- number one. It's not, now. it's not the best. It's not the first. Um, if you're not first, yeah. you're last. I don't know. Um, I it's Nightmare on Elm Street. I don't know what to say about it. Um, Johnny Depp isn't that great in the film. No, he's not. <laughs> well, his role is actually like way. It's so minimal. I mean, his character lines. He's in a lot of scenes where he just doesn't fucking say a word. He like, he he's just there, you know. I mean, but I mean, sets up the story. Sets up. I mean, the lore is part of the story, but I'm still gonna say more of the lore. Um, Freddy, there's, to me, there's almost no actual comedy in this. If it is comedy, to me, it almost feels accidental. 
whether it was accidental or not, but it came off to me when I just rewatched it as accidental. And, but I think it might be the, uh, the eighties in general. Cause a lot of eighties, like a lot of times you laugh when you're not supposed to. Laugh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I feel like the decade is definitely hits the most, um, with stuff like that. Uh, the scenes where his arms are stretched out. Freddie is honestly, his face for a while in the film is almost shadowed. Yeah, you like, don't really get a good look at him. He, it's very otherworldly. The film is always, and people are probably like, are you kidding me when I say this? But outside of like, obviously the shooting blood of Johnny Depp's kill, like, I don't think of that film as being super gory. But then when I, every time I rewatch it, there's a ton of, like, blood scenes, I guess you could say, or gore scenes in it. Yeah, there's the scene where the first girl dies or whatever, and she's, like, rolling around, like, covered in blood, yeah. like, on the ceiling and stuff like that. Um, it, yeah, a lot of I, things are bleeding. The, yeah. blo- the bag we talked about from the remake, which they do, in, obviously, in the original. Yeah. But the whole bloody bag well, yeah, and stuff I, like that. I agree with you. I don't think of it as, like, a gore film when I think of it. But it's, it's pretty yeah. gory, to be honest, yeah. when I think about it, like... Uh, at the time, um, Freddy's lines and how he is is more minimal, and I think it works. It's my, my biggest gripe in the whole series is Freddy goes, he just transitions so much into a different character. Like you talked about watching the yeah. first one and then watching Freddy's Dead. To me... It's like, is this a parody of the first one? It's it like, almost, what, am I, what am I watching? It almost becomes a parody of itself, and I think that's the biggest problem with horror sequels as we've we've talked about in these horror sequel podcasts we're doing this we're going to continue to rank franchises the reason why a lot of these films eventually quote unquote don't get the returns and the fail and and quote unquote fail but is because they become everything the opposite of everything they were trying to be initially they are they become parodies of themselves right they've just they've wore out their welcome you know, we need some time to go by and not see a Freddy film. Not, because now, me, I'm chomping at the bit for a new Nightmare on Elm Street or a new Friday the 13th. Like, all these years have gone by. With nothing. Probably yeah. why I liked the remake more initially, because it'd been, you know, I'd grown up now and I'd, I'd watched the, you know, initial films maybe seven, eight years prior. And I'm like, oh, a new Nightmare on Elm Street? Like... They used to think, obviously, the horror sequels, they need to bring money in every year, every year, every year, but you, we get burned out as, as human beings. Like, we're like, eh, what, I'll watch it on video, or ah, I've seen this. The thing, especially the average, the casual fan, they're like, oh, I've seen that. Why would I want to go see this in the theater? I've seen it four times already. Yeah. So. I agree. Um, yeah, it's just, the first one's just so iconic. Um, I don't really know what else to say. I mean, everyone knows, so I don't know what to really say about it. it Um, sometimes I think because it became such a big part of pop culture and became such a merchandising, like, juggernaut that I forget at times how great the first, or Nightmare on Elm Street is and how, it's not that how great, but sometimes, you know, films get overrated. I mean, they get overrated, especially now in the modern times. You hear the internet hype or you hear this or stuff like that. But when you really you know, think about when it came out and the way it was shot almost, I mean, you could say it's akin to Halloween, the original Halloween. Like, you go back and rewatch it, I'm like, wow, I can see why this became like a worldwide phenomenon. You right. Know? Really, I mean, being honest, I mean, it's just like, it's gorier than you think. The kills are inventive. The story was basically, to me, if you really think back in the history of horror, this was fresh, very fresh, almost yeah. unheard of. Like you know, and this was fairly late into the game. Um, this was this was eighty four. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, because I mean, Halloween was six years before that. Yeah, Friday the Thirteenth. How many had they come out with? Was this might have been like the third war? Nineteen eighty four was the year the final chapter came out. Friday the Thirteenth was supposed to be done. Yeah, when Nightmare on Elm Street started. Yeah. So I mean, it. It just, I think Nightmare on Elm Street should be really, it probably is credit. I mean, we're, we're probably treading some ground other people have talked about, but probably really should be credited for keeping that early 80s horror boom alive because it took it to the next, 
level. Next stage. Because so. people had seen slasher films now for five to six years. They kind of knew what they were getting into. And it did something so different. And had it not been done well, who knows if we even would have gotten Friday the 13th Part 5 and stuff like that. Like, if this well, would have, like, bombed, like, who knows? Well, two, I would say... I don't disagree with that, but I would say, who knows if we would have gotten Hellraiser on the big screen. Right. Because I feel like Hellraiser, the novel was already, I, I believe Clyde Barker had already probably written drafts of it and kind of had the ideas, but would it have been green light in the late 80s for a film, for multiple films, without the success of Nightmare on Elm Street? Maybe not. It might have never made it to the big screen or never made it to the Because it also it, it also does take that turn where it's more supernatural. Yes. Um, which would lead to Hellraiser. Because I mean, yeah, Jason is a zombie, it's supernatural because you can't fucking kill him. But, but there's there's nothing supernatural about the plot lines. He didn't hit supernatural till eighty six. So two years after Nightmare on Elm Street came out. Because cause you got to think, New Beginning, spoiler, I mean, I guess we'll just keep saying that, but New Beginning's not even Jason. It's some guy no, first name, Jason. Yeah. So Jason, until this point, was just some crazy hillbilly freak maniac that lived in, in the woods. And look at Michael Myers. Michael Myers wasn't even supernatural yet at this point either. No, because I didn't start till the whole thorn shit started yeah. so so it changed the game for all the other franchises around it so probably helped them succeed you know everyone like competition breeds success you know yeah just like wwe and AEW. hopefully we'll see, we'll, we'll see some shit going we'll on see with some that shit. we're big wrestling fan i'm a buddy still is but i'm a big wrestling fan i'm excited at the moment uh <laughs> But anything else left to say? Uh, um, I think I think that's that's a pretty good way to end it. Um, let us know down in the comments or on Twitter, anything like that, what your favorite Nightmare on Elm Street film in the franchise is. Um, let us know what you want us to cover um, for next year's. I know we've been hinting at Friday the Thirteenth, but maybe we can. Throw some, throw a Hellraiser. How many Hellraiser films are there? Like five? Okay. There's not oh, that many. Oh no, there's more than that. All right, I'll do it well, live, live on the air. One, two. So, original. Hellbound. Is Hellbound? No. Look, I'm fucking all right. Anyways, original number two. Hell on Earth is three. Four is Bloodline. Five is uh. Yeah. Inferno. <laughs> Oh yeah, in in there's five? so many. Holy yeah, there's like shit. nine or there's more than that. Jesus now. Christ, there's no. I've ever. seen the whole series, obviously. So the worst, the worst is the one that's an online RPG. Hold, on, let me look at your phone. I'm gonna say even if we do this <laughs> two <laughs> years later, I want to see the World of Warcraft Hellraiser for sure. No, it's fucking bad. <laughs> it's honestly probably the worst sequel of all time. <laughs> I, I'm not, you think I'm fucking kidding? It's fucking bad. Hell World. Hell World is the one. What was Hell Bound? Yeah, Hell Bound was too. I couldn't, I couldn't think about it right there. But Hell World, arguably the worst horror sequel. I'm gonna put it out there. Maybe we'll do the worst horror sequels. Worst pod- horror sequels podcast. I, I would actually love that. Or worst horror films we've ever done. Top ten. That could be. That might be better because it's not just sequels. Like that would. We'd probably pull some. <laughs> some horrible film. I probably have PTSD by the time we finish that fucking podcast. But there's yeah, there's, there's a, lot a lot. Of, I, there's a lot more I've than seen I thought. All of them. No, when you said five, I was like, you mean ten at least? <laughs> like yeah. Uh, um, but regardless, and let us know what you guys want us to cover on the show. Um, when we do Friday the Thirteenth, it's probably gonna have to be a two parter. Like there's no way if we went. I don't know how long this has been. It's probably been close to three hours at thank least. Thank you guys for still listening. To um, this point. But yeah, a lot more films in that franchise than this. This was only nine films, so it's hard, man. There's there's a lot to cover. Regardless, nine films to whatever. I mean, it's if you want to have talking points, yeah, it's a lot yeah. to cover. Um, but that's about this. That's about it for this time, you guys. Um, yeah, thanks for coming on, Miles. I've always, of course, I it's always, always a pleasure. I always appreciate. It. You know, I think that I probably do the best when we actually have lists. I guess I'm a big list guy. I You're don't a know. big I, list I, guy. I, I, big, I do better with it. Big sandwich guy. Big driveway guy. Ah, oh, fuck! Kill yourself. But uh, 
I feel like we're going to have a couple more this month coming up. Um, I don't know if you want to hint at it, but I think we're going to do a couple double feature. We might be reviews. doing. We're going to be doing some double features. Um, there's going to be another top ten with Miles coming soon, which we've already recorded. So we're very excited for you guys to listen to that one. That's going to be. I'm excited to listen to that back. So yeah, it will be good. Um, and anything. I mean, there's still time, you guys. If there's anything else you guys want us to hear, of course we do this podcast. Primarily in October, but I like to keep it going throughout the year. So if there's anything else you guys want us to cover, please let us know. Hit us up on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Um, But yeah, we're about to wrap this up, and we'll see you next time. Hope you guys have a good, if this is the only one you listen to for some reason, I hope not. But I hope you guys have a great October. Stay spooky and be safe out there. Well, that's about it for this time, you guys. I hope you enjoyed our ranking of all the Nightmare on Elm Street films. If you like this episode and you want to see more, make sure you're subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications, and all of that great stuff. We will see you guys back here again for another episode of the House of Horror coming very soon. But until then, stay spooky.